Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and uh, we are pleased to have a nice crowd with us this morning for our study session. Good morning, and welcome to the uh, Mesa City Council study session for February the 15th. Uh, Mr. Freeman is uh, excused from this meeting. The first item on our agenda is uh, to hear a presentation and discuss the strategies and priorities to reduce homelessness in Mesa, as recommended by a cross-sector coalition of service agencies, nonprofits, faith-based institutions, and city departments. That's one of the best agenda items I've seen written for a long time. Thank you. Good to have you with us. We have Natalie Lewis and Mark Young. Thank you very much for your work on this topic. My name is Natalie Lewis. I'm a deputy city manager here in Mesa, and I am joined with um, Mr. Mark Young, who's the CEO of Mesa United Way. Also in the audience, and because we have a nice crowd with us, we have members of our cross-sector coalition. So these are our service agencies, nonprofit agencies, faith-based institutions, and a cross-departmental um, staff team. And one of the things that we all have in common is that we um, serve individuals experiencing homelessness in Mesa. And um, several months back, Mayor Giles asked us to pull our, our resources together, to come together, to talk about what are some strategies that we can work on together, step out of our silos, find ways to optimize existing services, and really try to find outcome-driven initiatives that we, can, that we can pursue with each other. So in previous visits about homelessness, we've talked about insights about homelessness, what are the causes of homelessness, stats, and updates about services that we do, but also in the region. Today, we're really here to focus on the outcomes and the strategies that, that we're moving forward with. And, and from council's perspective, what we'd really like to hear from you is any feedback about these ideas and these approaches and helping us understand if we're heading in the right direction. So we had three broad goals as in our work together. And the first one was that we wanted the, um, the results and the plan to be shared and owned by all of us. Everyone who is working on this has a part to play and is working with each other to do that. And so um, we have the service agencies, the faith-based organizations, Downtown Mesa Association is also involved in this, the city and the departments. And then we also just acknowledge that homelessness isn't a parochial issue. And so we, what we do also has to connect to the region and into the East Valley in particular. We took a look very seriously and, um, and timed our work um, based on community priorities and, and a lot of what the council has been hearing from the community as it relates to this issue. So we took our priorities and we organized them into these areas, um, those items that we're working on now. Some of them we're working on now, some of them we're planning to work on now. Priorities and strategies that will take the next two to three years to complete as we um, develop them. And then longer term strategies are gonna take three plus years. And then the third thing we wanted to do is be very outcome driven and focused. And so we organized our work into the, these three areas, services for our homelessness, um, safety and security for all of Mesa's residents and supportive housing. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and he'll talk about the service related recommendations and strategies. Thank you, council members. We feel really great about coming up with this S cubed thing, so I wanted to just point that out to you. <laughs> Very cool. Um, as far as it comes to service, we are working on uh, creating a navigation center. We know that it's difficult for our homeless population to have a place to go, a single place to go where they can get the help they need. So with the help of St. Vincent de Paul, um, Paz de Cristo and Mark Center, we're expanding the hours at St. Vincent de Paul until noon. We are going, uh, Paz de Cristo is going to open at noon. Those locations are close to one another. And then Mark Center is gonna come in and offer navigation services, job training, and what, so that they have a location, the homeless folks have one location or uh, two locations, but a navigation center where they can get the help they need and have a place to be. When uh, St. Vinny's is closing early and Paz was opening up late, that left a gap of time there uh, for people to have a place to be. And we think that this will help mitigate some of the issues in downtown. We're also gonna add two downtown navigators. The work that's being done by those folks from CBI has been incredible. The, the touch that they've had with the homeless in the, hmm, sorry. in the downtown area has been significant. They have a good relationship with folks and have been able to help people move from one place to another. We know that relationship and community are the important things that help people move from where they are to where they'd like to be. And so we're gonna add two navigators. <clears throat> we have one now working downtown, as you know, and one working in the library. 
We also need to do a better job of quantifying the homeless population in our area and really across the East Valley. As you know, we did the point in time count recently. Those numbers are numbers that get used to try to determine where the homeless are, but we know that those numbers are woefully inadequate in helping us to understand what the real issues are. I was able to be a part of that this year. And uh, it's interesting what you cannot count. So we would come across camps where we knew that people had been, you know, sleeping bags that are still warm, food that's not eaten, but the folks weren't there, so we couldn't count that as a location. So we know that there are many folks out there that are hidden, that are uh, unaccounted for, people who are sleeping in cars, and, uh, and we need to find a way to figure out who, that, who those people are. We have another group working within the city, uh, led by Karen Kurtz, to help us get better access points for the hub and for the coordinated entry. Um, and they have done some excellent work in expanding uh, where folks can go to get the beginning help that they need. We've also added the city has a designated staff member to work on service coordination. That's Aaron Rains uh, from the police department. He's working uh, to help us understand the issue in a more, in a deeper way and help us work on some solutions. He spends a couple days at Macy United Way and a couple days working at the city as we continue to see what are the things that we need to do to coordinate the services. Down the road, some things we'd like to investigate is the Panhandler Mobile Van Work Program. Uh, there's a, an interesting program happening in Albuquerque. I believe we need to visit that and see how that works, but what they do is take a van, they pick up folks who are panhandling who are willing to work, they give them work during the day, pay them an, in the evening, and then offer them wraparound services so that they can move out of where they are into a new place. That's been successful there. It hasn't been successful <laughs> everywhere. So we'd like to visit that location and take uh, best practices from them. We wanna create a way that, uh, for the homeless people to actually have access to services in a way that's clear. One of the things that happens is um, when homeless folks come into Macy and I in a way looking for help, we hand them a resource package of about 15 pages of things that, places they can go to get help it doesn't take long making phone calls off that list and not getting an answer uh, for folks to give up. And so we need to clarify and, and um, make that list shorter and know that the people that we've got on the list are available to talk to them uh, immediately. We'd also like to work on an East Valley Navigation Center so it's not just Mesa, so that we're working with our, uh, the other communities, Tempe, Chandler, and Gilbert. Uh, maybe Scottsdale, to help come up with some regional solutions, maybe a regional center. And we've uh, looked at and talked about some places on the Tempe Mesa border that may work for that. Then long term, we want to just continue to look at what our plan is, what our effectiveness is, what's working, not working. It's one of those deals where we need to try some things. Just because it works in one community doesn't mean it'll work in this community. So we need to try some things. If it doesn't work, we need to come back to the drawing board and come up with some new solutions. So now we'll talk about some of the initiatives related to safety. Uh, one of the things when we had our discussions internally as an as a interdepartmental team is that it became really clear that there are probably 10 to 15 individuals in Mesa who are touching a lot of our departments. And we didn't know that was happening. Um, in some cases, we weren't helping each other out when we, when we were experiencing that. And, and they're, they're creating the greatest impact on, on our existing services today. And so one of the things that we would really like to do and are doing, and are doing this through um, um, Brandon Lavin and in the, in the police department and some of the things working with our existing system and the navigators, is to really get to those top 15 and work really hard on connecting them to services and getting them housed. Because if we do that, then the existing services that we already have in play, uh, we, can, we can optimize them and maximize them and put them to work in, in better ways. The other thing that we wanna do is um, really look at the safety and security of the library, the main library in particular, and the art center. Um, and so um, Officer Aaron Rains has been working with our staff to update our safety and security policies um, so that everyone who uses these um, facilities is, feels welcome and feels safe when, when they're there. 
Encampments is another issue that we have, and this is really a citywide issue, and, and in fact, it's, it's an East Mesa issue more than ever because there's a lot of desert out there and open space, and, and encampments do happen. And so we're going to take a cross-sector approach to these, and um, Aaron's gonna lead this effort, and we're gonna connect people, we're gonna get out there, and we're gonna do as much as we can to connect these folks to health and housing resources. Um, and, and when we need to, we will use enforcement. And then the last thing that we've been talking about, and um, I used to have this in the two to three year time period, but frankly, the courts and the prosecution office and the police department have been working really hard. It's called a community court. It's modeled after our veterans court. Um, and the whole idea is that, you know, we have a lot of homeless individuals that, that experience our courts and there's quite a cost to the system there. And, and so what we wanna do is minimize those costs, but also do that while we're trying to connect them to services. So we wanna give them every incentive to, to get help and to kind of get out of this system and into a place where they're not repeat offenders and coming back to the courts and costing us more money. So, so there's been a really good team effort and we're working on this now and we're actually, I think, ready to start a pilot program for this in the next two to three months. I'm sorry, Natalie. Sorry, Sorry, Natalie, I have a quick question. If sure. you can invite Judge Tafoya and Paul Thomas up, um, I'm kind of curious what we currently do and how effective that is. And if sure. they could come up and explain that, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, Mayor and Council Member Glover, uh, you had a question or yeah. what? Can you explain what the courts are currently doing um, with the homeless popula population when they come to the courthouse? Okay, uh, what we're doing is, uh, number, first of all, we've uh, had our first meeting yesterday in the implementation of our uh, homeless uh, or community court because we're not just looking at doing a just the homeless issue involves a lot of issues. I've been at Paws of Crystal for a long time going down there. Mental health issues, alcoholics, uh, there's a whole range. So our community court is gonna be dealt, uh, is gonna be built to deal with these issues and provide the services. Now, what have we done up to this point? Uh, what we've done is this. With the uh, population, as they come in and are booked, uh, we apply, uh, number one, we, we will, will release them, but on, uh, only if they have, um, don't have a big history, but if we keep them, we appoint a lawyer, they're in jail at that point, and we'll have uh, them brought back to our court within 10 days, sometimes it can be eight or nine, they'll see a public defender, then they'll negotiate with the prosecutor and uh, try to resolve those cases. If they can't, then we try to sit, we set up for trial within two or three weeks uh, so that they're not in jail 30, 40, 60 days while everybody gets ready for trial. So that process has uh, sped up. And then uh, if they're placed on probation, they can be violated and brought back into court. But um, you can't arrest your way out of this issue. Is there... Uh, we got people, and I can name them now, uh, so I spent um, 90 days in our jail court last summer, every day I worked. And um, you just have some people that are continuously been in our court since 2005, and we're trying to work with those people to get them services. And, and uh, there's a, always gonna be a, a window of opportunity where they're gonna take advantage of it, and other times they're not. So uh, if, if they're not, then you're gonna have to be dealt with in the criminal courts. But um, the, the solution is to get to them ahead of that. And a lot of these people, and I know that's the direction as we've talked uh, to, the, uh, to Mr. Rain, I know the direction is going, uh, uh, what do we do? Don't file the charge, try to take care of the issue beforehand and, and once you get the court involved, it's a costly process. You can even have Rule 11 hearings uh, where they're declared incompetent, then they're released, the case is dismissed, and then they're back out again and the case is refiled again. So the efforts we're making now as a city, as a community, are incredibly good. And, uh, 
and uh, we are uh, looking as a group to attack the issue of uh, the status of homelessness uh, and uh, not be biased against their people, they are people, and not be biased against them just because of their status. And this city has me shown remarkable backbone in, in assisting uh, in trying to resolve the issue. That's my view. Now, Paul, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I might add that, uh, Councilmember Glover, Mayor and City Council, we've, we've kind of seen this reality coming down the road with the mentally ill veterans' homelessness as a population coming into the courts. We've done structural things to prepare for this. Uh, a few years ago, we committed to two dedicated arraignment divisions at the court, which means all cases come through those two courts first. That allows us to centralize cases uh, by whether or not they're homelessness, uh, in trespassing, have mental health issues, veterans or whatever. So previously when cases came through five different divisions, it was hard to centralize what we were gonna do with those cases. We've supported that with the Veterans Court, as you all know, we've spent a lot of time and effort creating the Veterans Court. So veterans now move to a separate docket, separate court where other uh, veterans are there they support each other, and we have the entire range of services at Veterans Court. The other thing we've done, which has been groundbreaking, is we led the effort to pilot resolving the competency issue with uh, defendants with mental health issues locally. Previously, that was only Superior Court jurisdiction. We'd have to send that case to Superior Court. We wouldn't get that case back for eight or nine months. We were successful in piloting, doing those hearings locally. We acquired Superior Court jurisdiction to do that. We resolved those cases um, within 45 days with all local resources. The program was so successful that the Supreme Court went to the legislature, changed the law last year, permitting all local courts to do competency issues locally. It's better service for the defendants, the community, the lawyers, and everybody involved. And it cut the time down to 45 days. So structurally, we've made the changes to respond to uh, those with mental health issues, veterans coming through, and the last piece of this will be the uh, homeless population that we typically see through trespassing. So whether it's a mental health issue, a, a veterans issue, uh, homelessness, or whatever their issues are, we've shifted the court in a way to respond to those kinds of issues with those defendants coming through court. We had a meeting yesterday at two o'clock, and we think we've got the procedural side worked out for a community court, <clears throat> we're looking to spin that up in about 90 days. Uh, there's computer programming has to be done. We met with the prosecutors. Uh, Aaron Rain has been assisting us with that effort. And, it, and the community court concept does not limit the case to only homelessness. So if there's a mental health issue, some other underlying social problem, uh, whatever, we'll take that case. We'll service it through community court. And so uh, we're a little bit ahead of the curve, but it's nice to be working uh, and seeing the city shift all of its efforts to this sadly needed direction that we need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, just for you, uh, what, what are we doing to, um, I know that we're protecting or we're trying to help the, the homeless person um, or the panhandler that's out there, but how do we also protect the businesses from the chronic um, panhandler that's on their property that won't leave or um, reoccurringly comes back and is impacting their business. Are, are, we, are we doing anything there to protect our businesses well, as well? Uh, yeah, we have a huge number of people in jail uh, for that. Uh, and like I said, I spent uh, 90 days every day this last summer working on that issue. And uh, uh, here's the... Uh, here, the, the issue is safety for the uh, merchants too, but it's a nuisance crime. It's in the parks, it can be in downtown. And I can go down now and I can start naming, uh, and I think when we met, I, was, I, I named a lot of people that uh, when they're saying we're not putting them in jail, uh, it's not a solution, but they are in jail six months at a time and they get out, two days later they're booked again and they're in jail another six months. Now we have one, not just one person, but I'm thinking of one person in particular that uh, has been in and out of jail since 2005 
an alcoholic. So uh, yes, uh, we're being aggressive in that regard, uh, but uh, and now if uh, what we try to do is try to get them out so they can try to resolve their issues. And now um, if, you, if you were to keep everybody in jail for every one of them, uh, it, 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 it just, it would be like a Gandhi issue. You know, you, you can't solve the issue by arrest and incarceration. It just can't be solved that way. So, um, yeah, we are being aggressive in that regard, in my mind. Thank you. Mr. Luna has a question. Actually, my question is going to be directed to Natalie, but certainly um, Judge Sofoy and Paul could be here as well. Um, you know, certainly the closure of Burn Bar Library in Phoenix has caused probably a proliferation of oryx that more uh, homeless is coming into the Mesa area. What are we doing working with our Phoenix partners as well as Valley Metro because I think they access the light rail to get into our community. And what efforts have been made to try to mitigate that, the issues related to homelessness? Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor Luna. So um, we're working on at an East Valley regional level right now. There is a team of city managers from the East Valley that have come together and that includes the city of Phoenix that have been part of the conversation. And there's been a lot of dialogue about the basically regional redistribution of homelessness that has happened. So we all know this is not just a Mesa issue. It's not just a Phoenix issue though. The two cities are the hardest hit. It's everybody has seen this region wide. And so we are coming together and talking about this issue and how we can work together and um, share our information with each other and our resources to figure things out. And um, as a result of that dialogue is where the East Valley um, Navigation Center has come up. Phoenix has said, you know, we have our Human Resources Center in downtown Phoenix. We have, um, we've kind of done our part and we've been overburdened for a very long time and we need some additional accesses um, throughout the region. So, um, you know, while we don't want to recreate what, what has been built in the downtown Phoenix area, we do want to have a, an efficient system and, an, and a closer place where we can send um, people experiencing homelessness or where the navigators can take them to so that it creates efficiency in our system. And so we are working with some East Valley partners to um, create another navigation center that would then again supplement what is going to be happening at Paz de Cristo and St. Vinny. So we don't want any center to get overburdened and um, and have these issues. We want to be efficient and effective, not duplicate, but just make sure that we have what we need to um, to kind of service um, these individuals and, and do it in an efficient way. Mr. Thompson. Natalie, I'm, I'm glad too that you to, to see on your slide about the encampments and looking at it citywide because I think Councilmember Luna and I are seeing a huge uptick of not only panhandling in districts five and six, but also homelessness uh, in encampments. The, but the biggest problem that we have is um, we don't have the resources available in the Far East Valley. All of our resources are downtown. In fact, Mark Young and I spoke about this uh, a few months back. Uh, that you know when when we when our um, law enforcement comes across someone that's homeless and they want help um, you know that's literally taking an officer off the streets mm -hmm. that otherwise should, could be patrolling and taking care of the community but they're basically babysitting um, you know it's 30 minutes from from district 6 if you live on the far part the uh, far edge of uh, e uh, eastern edge of district uh, 6 it's probably more like 45 minutes to drive from there to right. downtown. And um, so you're literally taking an officer off the street for two to three hours uh, while they're trying to help um, a, a panhandler or a homeless person that wants the help. Uh, and, and to me, that's we, we really need to look at trying to figure out how we get those resources into um, into our into our district so that we're not taking you know the vital role of a police officer off the streets to take care of somebody that needs help. Right. Um, um, Councilmember Thompson, thank you so much for bringing that up, and, and we couldn't agree more. We will always need our police officers and our assistance from our police officers, but to the extent that we can create a better system where we're maximizing their, their true work and where they need to be is exactly where we're at. And, um, you know, Aaron, having Aaron focused on this has been incredibly helpful, and I give a lot of credit to our new chief of police who really understands this 
and he, he sees the benefit of it. And so he's been all supportive of having this and this, this very true connection from the police department to other departments. And so we really want to strengthen that over time because, you know, Aaron himself is a police officer and he can put on his uniform anytime and, and go out with our navigators and, and deal with some of these kinds of things. And so we get, we just have that extra level of service and assistance, yet they're all working together and working with each other instead of just in silos. So Mayor, Councilor Thompson, I think the council will have an opportunity this year as we look at our um, allocation of CDBG dollars that um, you may want to emphasize that as part of the proposals and how those nonprofits are allocating um, while they're addressing homelessness, but making sure it's done on a citywide basis. That would, that's what we have to rely upon because uh, we can't do this just with public safety. As you said, that's a um, significant resource dedicated, that would be dedicated to this. So we, we may, through our CDBG funding, may, I think the thought is in making it a priority um, to address some of these issues across the city. Thank you. Mr. Luna. And just real quick, Natalie, um, you might want to extend your, your net, if you will, to Gilbert, Queen Creek Public Schools. Uh, there are some federal funds for homeless youth, uh, kids that go to our schools that are homeless. And yes. I was equally surprised to find out that individuals camp out and they have families camping out and they send their yeah. I'm glad they send their kids to school, but the fact right. that they're camping out in, in the desert is yeah. to me is appalling. Yes, we, um, as part of our efforts in coming together, Mesa Public Schools did come and just gave us a really good idea. Um, and we will reach out to those other districts, but I was just shocked to hear in one school year, last school year, they identified about 1,400 homeless children in our school district throughout the 86 schools in our district. So yes, and thank you. We've got a, a long presentation that we need, and we, we probably we're, should have dedicated getting, an entire day <coughs> to talk yes, to, to this topic. Yes, we are getting to the end here. Well, um, I, I have a couple quick questions. Okay. I, I was holding my questions, but if you don't, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple now, uh, <coughs> given that we've got the, the judge and some, some of these topics have been raised. First of all, I 100% I endorse the specialty court, uh, community court concept, and I, I see on, on your presentation, this was something you were thinking of doing over the next two or three years. Sounds like the courts are not waiting for that, and we've got two or three months is more of the timeline. Um, so that's great. I was going to say, Mayor, uh, uh, when I talked to you uh, uh, about seven or eight months ago, you said, when are we going to get something done there? Uh, and you gave some, it was clear direction, so we've been working along that line. Uh, so uh, a lot of the credit goes to the leadership here for that. I, I think we'll be up and running maybe within 90 days on a community court. Right. Right. That's great. And again, we ought to have a, we could spend an hour talking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, just to give you a Breeders Digest version, doing a great job on the Veterans Court issue, applying that same concept to the homeless issue, where we've got, the, as Judge DeFoya described, these frequent flyers that they don't need to be mm -hmm treated like criminals and needed to be treated like people who need help and, and we're going to save a ton of money and resources and jail time and other things if we take a more therapeutic approach rather than a punitive approach with them. So thank you for, yeah. for you know, embracing briefly, that. Just briefly, you know, just to go along with the community court concept, um, uh, forgot to mention to you that we are doing, uh, we are holding court at Paz de Cristo yeah. and the, the, the penalty there is if they uh, owe a fine or whatever, and they shouldn't owe a fine, but they do, then we have them do community service for Paz de Cristo at Paz de Cristo, and they get it done. So that's a service to the community there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that as it goes on. So thank you. Any, any other questions for the folks from the courts? <coughs> thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for the great job. Another quick question, just and, and, and like, I get, like I say, as long as we're at this point in the program, we've talked about safety, uh, and I see uh, we've talked about adopting uh, safety procedures at the library and arts centers. Again, I, I would encourage Heather and the library folks to look at this now instead of later. Yeah, we, have, it yeah. is. we actually have a draft ready to put out. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, and I'm saying what everybody has already said, but the idea that we're doing our early literacy programs in the same rooms and brick and mortar as the, uh, the public Wi-Fi access to me seems like contradictory and it, it, that's an intimidating experience for those young families that are, have to kind of run the gauntlet to to get in to u utilize those services so I, I I think we need to address that now as opposed to later uh, and then my uh, part of my motivation in asking us to look into this was to prioritize resources because our the need outstrips the resources and and we are about to go, go through the funding process uh, here in the next few weeks 
And I was hoping to get some insights so that we could prioritize, prioritize and, and, and create it. Where are the holes in the safety net? Where are the most vulnerable people in our community not getting served? And what do we need to do to incentivize the human service agencies to address those most critical needs? And one of the things I heard a moment ago is, uh, and a couple of our my colleagues have, have uh, made a point of this, we are, I think we are lacking in services on the east side. Uh, we have created, uh, I think, a pretty robust system in downtown Mesa, but a lot of the population we need to serve is, is on the far east side. Maybe part of this had to do with the criteria that was used to, uh, to fund affordable housing in the past, and so a lot of those agencies with the wraparound services are congregated here in, in the west side. So I, I see we got the human service agencies all here. I think, I mean, do we need to put out an RFP saying, hey, uh, you know, we've got a large population on the east side that, that is not being served, and in fact, it's a drain on our public safety resources because as Mr. Thompson just described, when we encounter these folks, you know, we got, it takes an hour to get them where they need to go to, to address services. That, that, that seems like something that I think we could take a more strategic look at, uh, and, and maybe particularly during the CDBG, as Mr. Brady mentioned earlier, uh, during the CDB, CDBG conversation saying, hey, well, we want to pay some money to create so, some resources on the Far East Side. Um, that uh, opportunity is coming to council in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll have the opportunity to have that conversation. So the, the applications are already in. It's gone through the community review process. So I think it's coming to council and then the um, subcommittee, subcommittee will, um, council committee. Community and cultural development. Cultural community. development will have an opportunity to go through those. Yeah. And that would be an opportunity to have that conversation. But. I think we can see the priorities recommended. Um, those that are uh, trying to address issues related to homeless are um, getting the highest scores. Great. Mr. Thompson. And one thing I, I want to make sure that we're using caution as well on is, um, you know, I want to make sure that Mesa doesn't become the mecca for the homeless population, that all of a sudden, you know, we're offering services that other cities aren't providing and everybody from, you know, the homeless people from Glendale uh, all the way across um, to the East Valley decide that Mesa is the landing spot and because they can come here to get help. So I think it's imperative that we work with our surrounding communities um, and, and get them to offer the same type of support uh, that Mesa is going to provide or we're going to see, I think, an influx of, of homeless uh, coming into Mesa for those services that otherwise um, they wouldn't. So need to make sure we're using caution on that and working with our, our partners. We don't do that. Thank you, though. Um, another, a couple of other quick questions. Uh, on the, the Albuquerque model, the Panhandler model, that's uh, gotten a lot of great press over the last couple of years. Uh, I think, did I see that Tempe is adopting a, some form of that model? We might not need to go all the way to Albuquerque to, to explore how easily we could adopt that. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm anxious to learn more about it. Uh, with regard, I do think yeah. that can help us address some of the problems in the East Valley. If we had a, a, a robust program of coming out, because I know it is a lot of panhandlers out in the East Valley as well. If we had if we had vehicles that were going out to the East Valley to pick folks up, so that it's not a police issue, that we could help them find work or transport them back to Vinnie's and and Positive Cristo, then we can. I think instead of maybe putting brick and mortar out on the East Side, we can do some of this by uh, transporting and helping people find work. Mark, during the, the meetings you've been having over the last few months, have you identified some critical holes in the safety net? For example children, uh, women with children. I mean, are, are there, so I know a lot of the agencies that are in this room, they're getting phone calls uh, from very sad situations, and sometimes they have to say, I'm sorry, the situation you're describing, we have no answer for. Absolutely, and, and it is problematic. So many of the folks that are visible are oftentimes chronically homeless, and we do need to certainly be concerned about them, but I'll give you, an, this is anecdotal, Evidence. So I have a family that I've been working with for three months, husband and wife and 11-year-old boy. They sleep in their truck in a Lowe's parking lot so that they can get their boy to school every day. Um, we finally were able to get them some services through PAWS. They did some work on getting a resume written. We took them to the housing, uh, to save the family, got them hooked up with the housing hub. 
and it's going to be six weeks to three months before there's any place for them to go so they are still living in their truck in the Lowe's parking lot. And that story gets repeated over and over and over and over again. There are two areas that, that are concerning. One is that number of children that are homeless in our schools that and that group, when they are considered homeless, that often means couch surfing, moving from home to home, switching schools, not having any kind of consistency in their life. And there's that group of folks that are right on the edge of being homeless. As rents go up without wages going up, they're not able to afford the houses that they're in. And so the, the, the lack, the place where there's a giant hole, the, the gap in the net, is emergency and bridge housing. When uh, HUD and the Continuum of Care decided to uh, take away transitional housing, that created a, a tremendous burden. So if you were to call any of the incredible agencies that we have, they would tell you that their spaces are all full. There's no place to put anyone. Not only is that true here, but that's true across Maricopa County. And that's because the focus has been taken off of that transitional housing. Um, we, so we need emergency and bridge housing, whatever that may look like. This summer I had an opportunity to visit uh, some places in uh, Eugene and in Portland that are using Conestoga huts and tiny homes to address this issue. They are communities built and managed by, other, by the homeless population, and it's an amazing thing to see. I think that that is a direction that we need to consider. Additional bridge housing, whether it's Conestoga huts, tiny homes, working with um, hotel places, uh, trailer parks, whatever it may be, to find places where we can place people while they wait to get into more permanent housing. I do want to say the faith community and for our city have, have really latched onto this idea. Um, we have some churches that are interested in Conestoga huts. Uh, and a Conestoga hut is about a $600 hut that you, a couple of people can live in. It's nothing fancy, but it's air conditioned. And uh, the suggestion would be that we would place those throughout Mesa, no more than six in any specific location on church properties that are willing to do that. And they would manage and offer the case work, at least initially, for the families on their property. Then we would hook them up with caseworkers that would get them started through the process into coming into more permanent housing. I think that's... Um, I think we should pilot that and see how that works. And we do have some churches who are willing to do that. I am concerned as we look at CDBG money that we, um, that we remove some of the support that's coming to the nonprofits that are working now to place it in some new areas because the, the work that's being done now is critical and they're full. They, they do need the support that they are getting today in order to continue to do that work. I think Mesa United Way the faith communities and private dollars need to come together to create some of these solutions. I think House of Refuge is a perfect example of how that can work. So when they lost all of their funding from HUD, they worked really hard to find private dollars that would reopen their spaces and they should be applauded. And it is also an opportunity for us to see that that can work. So in this list, and so that in short, that's that. I do want to say this. We talk about, whenever there's a conversation about homeless people, we, we say a few things. We say, we talk about addiction issues, we talk about mental health issues, and certainly that is a part of what's happening in the homeless population. But there are many, many, many people out there that aren't suffering from either one of those conditions that have just landed on really rough times. And we've got to figure out a way to help them as soon as we can, because once they get used to being on the street and creating community there, it's much more difficult to get them the help that they need. So anything that we can do either prevention-wise or focusing on people who have been homeless for six months or less, I think would help alleviate this issue uh, in the long term. Thank you. Here's what we could use from you guys. Uh, money and some money. I don't know. Um, I'll I tell you a thing that we could really use some help with. The continuum of care um, that uh, determines how the HUD dollars are spent, um, they need some encouragement from other people other than providers about how they are allocating those dollars. Uh, you guys have clout, and they would listen to you. 
And so any communication that you can have with uh, the Maricopa Association of Governments and the Continuum of Care would be very helpful. I would encourage you and our nonprofit partners to, uh, to get together and have conversations so that we understand exactly what's being offered now. It's a wide range of programming and opportunities and, um, and we need to continue to support that work. Um, and this is going to take us some time. Uh, you know, we're never going to get to zero. There will always be homeless people. Um, and we need to look at it from both directions. We need to take, make sure that there's safety in our community, uh, not just for the non-homeless, but for the folks who are homeless. We've got to find a way uh, to meet their needs, to help them move from where they are to a better place. And, uh, and, we, and we can do that as we work together. I, I really do want to applaud the faith community, in my opinion, uh, they are the linchpin to making uh, significant change for us in, in the short term. And then I wanted to just very quickly thank the City Council. You are always very interested in this and supportive when we do come forward. So thank you for your questions and the comments this morning and feedback. I also want to thank the enormous amount of people who are, are working on this with us. This is now a team, and we're going to continue meeting as such. Um, and um, Steve Copobras, is he here? This he is morning? here. So Steve Capobra is with um, Catholic Charities, um, was core to helping us facilitate. He basically is a trained facilitator and offered his services for free so that we could have these dialogues in, in a very efficient way. And so, um, Steve, thank you so much for what you did and, and helped us um, pull all of these things together. And with that, if there are any other questions, we're, we're here. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Uh, just really quick, uh, thank you for your work in the community, Mark and, and Natalie. Uh, this issue has been here for a long time. I remember Margie Frost, if you were here in the 90s, uh, she was a champion in helping uh, work with our homeless men. And I see Mike Hughes back there. We have the men's shelter as a result of that. And so working together, I think we can achieve some solutions. So I appreciate our nonprofits, our human service agencies, as well as our faith-based communities coming together uh, to try to mitigate the issues related to homelessness. So thank you for all your support. Mr. Redia. Yeah, um, you mentioned, Natalie, uh, the identification of 10 people. How are we working on a, a shared database with the nonprofits and our, our city <laughs> staff uh, so that we can uh, limit duplication efforts, perhaps, uh, that might be happening and maximize resources uh, and identifying some trends? Or uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? So I can, and, um, and and members of the team are here if we if there's something that I miss. But I, I will tell you that it started as a very simple thing. We just started talking to each other and sharing information with one another, and and so um, we are doing that, and we have identified. We're working with our nonprofits and with our city departments to have those dialogues and those conversations. And and Officer Lavin is here. He is um, really kind of overseeing that effort, and has um, they've already pretty much found the people that that we're going to start focusing on and working with. Um, and then the other thing is just, again, we really do need help from the continuum of care to help us get more access to information that's existing and out there. Um, the information is private. It's highly protected information. And so there's a lot of different things to do to kind of get access to that. But we know if we can get better access, then we'll be able to have a much better idea about how many homelessness you know, people in Mesa experiencing homelessness there are and really where they are. We have, a, we have an idea with a point in time, but we really don't know the extent of the problem. We just know what we hear from our community. So, um, so we would really like to get more data and really quantify the problem. And there is understanding of that, the continuum of care. They just move slow. They've got to figure out how to share this data. Yeah. And you know what Karen Kurtz often says is we got to figure out how to move data, not people. You don't want to pick somebody up on power and Southern and have to figure out how to get them down to the housing hub at 40th and Van Buren so you can get them on a list to wait for eight weeks before they get any help. They should be able to go to some place much closer than that. And I should add just that, you know, most of the people at the county level and the state level, they're, they're good people trying to do good work too. They're not trying to be block walls or anything like that. There's just a lot of protections and safety things that they're doing to try to make sure that they're lim eliminating liabilities and, and frankly being respectful to individuals. Thank you. One of the last questions I had you answered, so you're going to continue to meet. Yes. Uh, and I, I would uh, I thank you to everyone in this room who participated in this process over the last several months. Uh, I, I think just doing that, what good came from it. But I would, as we've done in the past, where we've had these great panels that have come together, worked hard on a, on a solution, 
I, I, I would ask you to please give me some written recommendations. Uh, give us maybe a one sheet with some bullet points, because otherwise there's the, there's the possibility that your great work will be forgotten and uh, we'll be asking you to do the same thing, you know, a year or two from now, because we haven't made progress on what we learned during this process. So during the upcoming funding uh, discussions, I'm sure <clears throat> you'll be uh, referenced frequently. But if you could give me uh, just a few bullet points of things that distill what you've done over the last few months into if you're going to do one or two or three or four things, here's where you should start because this is the most pressing need. That would be very beneficial to me. I and and I, I, I think for the rest, for the whole city, frankly. And, and I would like to, what, after you guys have made determinations on CDBG money, we have, it's not a lot of money, but we have some money set aside at Mesa United Way. We'd like to also write an RFP to fill in some of these gaps. So if, you know, if we need to figure out how to do this uh, home, this uh, work program like they do in Albuquerque, then maybe that's something that we fund and we can get that up and running as a pilot program. If we, if you guys would be interested in the Conestoga Huts, we can fund that and write the RFP and get that thing up and running and have a look at it and see if it works. We, we want to be a partner in that as well, trying to figure out how, how to n not hurt the existing work and finding dollars to work these pilot programs to see what, what may work as well. Does that make sense? Great. Any other questions? Again, thank you very much, everyone. That uh, This is an ongoing issue, but thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. You bet. The next item on our agenda for this meeting is to hear a presentation and provide direction on the continuation of the alternative expenditure limitation, also known as the home rule option. We invite our budget director, Candace Canestrano, for forward. Candace, thank you for being here. I think you can go ahead. Well, we, we can, people will file out in a very orderly and quiet way and we'll be able to hear you. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to wait a couple minutes. So. Well, maybe you should. Thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm, uh, sure. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Please proceed. All right, great. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Candace Canestraro, Management and Budget Director. And with me today, I have uh, Robert Baer. He is our Operations Budget Coordinator in our office. And the thing we want to talk to you about today is our home rule and, and continuing that home rule. Um, this is really kind of a, a follow-up to all the education that we did last year. Um, but last year, we weren't uh, faced with the home rule option, so this year we are. So, and this is going to be a very busy budget season. Uh, we anticipate over the next three months. And so there's no action or anything we need to take on what we're talking about today. But we wanted to kind of get it in front of you before we kind of get in the middle of all of the budget uh, information. And we'll be coming back to you around the May, May time period for you to actually take some action on this. So today is really just more of an education. Uh, so the Arizona Constitution, uh, we require some things on the budget side. And one of the things is it requires a budget balanced budget. We talk about that every year, how we can adopt a budget that has expenses or anticipated expenses greater than our anticipated resources. Um, that's one of the things that we operate under. One of the other things that we operate under is an expenditure called expenditure limitation. It was set back in 1979-80. And what it does is it sets the city's budget limit at what the budget was during the 79-80 budget um, year with and then adjust it for population and inflation growth. Um, and that's called the exponential limitation um, at the state level. However, it does allow for cities to um, have a local election to approve an, an expenditure or, or an alternative to that particular formula. So it's a state formula that we fall under, but our city, um, our city voters can choose to do an alternate to that particular formula. There are three different alternates that are available to the cities. Um, one is termed as home rule. Um, that's the one that the city of Mesa chooses to follow. And we've had that in place since the year uh, 2000. There's also a permanent adjustment expenditure base. And there's also the ability to just do a one-time override. So a city can choose to just do it for one year if they choose to do that. Okay. What the home rule um, Excuse me, Candace. option. Mr. Sorry? Thompson has a question. 
Uh, maybe I'm just too far ahead, but on the permanent adjustment of expenditure base, I thought I read that there was a, someone locally in the Valley here, a city locally, that was going to put that on their ballot. Is that something that we should be looking at? No? Okay. Right, for, sm for smaller cities. And we did look at this um, once in the past, back in um, when we went to the election in 2000. Um, we looked at all of the options at that time, and um, we determined that the home rule we thought was the better one for our size of a city. What home rule does is it allows local control by the mayor and council over the budget each year. Now, that doesn't take us away from the balanced budget. We're still, we still have to have a balanced budget. So each year, we can still only adopt a budget that was within our resources on an annual basis. Um, but it puts the control within this, the council um, to set that. So if there are um, um, a, things that we want to do that particular year, maybe we've saved up a lot of cash to do a cash type project. Um, it would allow us to just set the budget to do that cash project without having to worry about the state limitation on the formula. Um, the permanent base, what that does is that goes back and resets that $79.80 dollar amount, and then you still have population and growth applied to it. So it still doesn't allow for that fluctuation from a year-to-year -year basis on something that the council may choose to do that particular year. And I'll give you an example. So um, in years past, when we've known they were going to have to replace like a, uh, our financial system or some large system, but we know we've got four or five years before that's going to happen, we've um, oftentimes have said, well, let's start setting aside money each year, uh, anticipating that fairly large expenditure so it doesn't hit us on one year. And so we've kind of created, I guess, we set aside dollars or reserve or whatever to anticipate that day. Well, the way these rules are written, that would count against our cap of expenditure. So we really think the local control option, kind of, it's just an example why the local control gives us the flexibility to pay down, or sorry, to um, anticipate large expenditures, put them in reserve, set them aside, because uh, otherwise, the way this is set up, a formula, it's like it's an annual look, and you have to like spend only the money you need in that year, and it really doesn't allow for us to manage our resources better. So that that just kind of give an example, because we, we've done that a few times, mm -hmm. knowing that we have you know, replacing a large financial system or some piece of equipment that's coming up, um, we know it's going to need to be replaced. We've taken the uh, anticipating that we've saved up dollars over the year. But the way these formulas work, it actually count against our expenditure cap. Mr. Luna. Uh, Candace, as far as the overrides, are they similar to what school districts do? But they do it over a period of five to seven years. This is what, only one time. Is that correct? It's actually, no, it's um, good for four years Okay. Um, as we go for the home rule option. So we come back to the voters every four years and ask them to renew our home rule um, alternative is so, what we do. And that's override for override? It's called an alternative. We don't want to use the word override. It's not okay. override. No, I, I, I saw yeah. that. Well. We're yeah. not overriding the state. We call it what, local control. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it just it just allows us local <clears throat> control of setting the budget okay. on an annual basis. Okay. Um, and it is good, and we'll cut up about that, but it's good for four years. Okay. So after we have the election, it's good for the following four fiscal years, and then we go back out and renew it again with the voters. Um, One-time override would be something that a city might use if they do have that one, you had, you'd have to go out every time we had that large expenditure that we'd want to do in that year. And then you'd have to ask for just that one year we're going to go over the, the formula. Is kind of how some of the cities have used it. Um, there are sanctions for exceeding the expenditure limitation, and so that's why it's very important that um, we have an alternative that allows us the local control because the sanctions do become very high um, if we were to go over um, the expenditure limitation if we were um, following the formula. Our current home rule, as I mentioned, um, was originally approved back in March of 2000, um, and it has been renewed in 2004, 2008, 2010, and 2014. So um, every time that we have gone out, the voters have approved to remain with local control over setting the budget. The current authorization will expire June 30th of 2019. So what that would do is we need, we would need to put this on the November 2018 ballot, and then that would be effective then for the following fiscal year. So just council, just that what statement right there, we know we're going to have to have a local election in November. Correct. If nothing else, just for this, just this point. Correct. Um, and just to get an overview of kind of the, the state limitation in that formula, 
that from Rila back in 1979-80 again is based on the budget that City of Mesa had back during that time. And that budget did not have the additional revenue streams that we have today that the voters have approved. I'm wanting to add the fire, the firefighters and the police officers and the quality of life. I'm wanting to do additional funding for our streets uh, for repair and maintenance and extension and those types of things. And also like the regional funds that we get that also funds our streets as well. So all of those elections happened since this rule was put in place. Um, and so those are not a part of the formula um, that they look for in the $79.80 uh, dollar amount. I'm sorry, can we go back to a point Mr. Brady made just a moment ago? Does this have to be on the November ballot? It yeah, you saw the, the timing, the timing. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons that you see that 2000, March 2008, mm -hmm. and then we had to do it on the two, we, had a, we did it sooner than the four years, so we could get We did it, on it the sooner November, when we had to move our elections. It has to be on an election where you're electing council members or had the ability to elect council members. And so when they moved, when they had the state requirement to move our election that used to be in the spring to the fall, um, you'll see that's why there's only a two-year gap between some of these. We had to do it early, um, otherwise we would run out of our authorization before we would have our election. Mayor, Council. Yes. Um, the election, you couldn't do, you can do home rule in August also. It just presents a timeline issue at this point because we have to call the election for August in April. So but it is, it doesn't have to be held in November, but at this point it presents a that's timeline. My, that's my question. I, I, we know for sure we're having an August election. Mm -hmm. It might be Correct. that council races are resolved in the August election, and uh, so I'm, and, and there may be other issues that should be going on. I, I'm just trying to get what the lay of the land is. What do we have to do, and what are there right. are options? Yeah, we've always tried to do it in November mm -hmm. uh, to piggyback on other elections. Exactly. And I think we can still do it even if there isn't... Um, still a council race going on in November. And Mayor and Council, also this would be a citywide um, election and not always on the primary do we have a citywide. And so it would require a special election in the other districts if there weren't anybody running in those districts. So that's why we tend to put it on the uh, primary, I mean the uh, November election. Sense. Okay, General. thank you. And some of the things that we don't really talk about here, they're kind of the behind the scenes. Uh, you guys never really see them is that um, part of that timeline is there's a lot of back and forth on the publications that we have to do and the public notices um, that we have to do with this. We file with the state what we're going to say and then we have to do the file, public notices. So there's a lot of legal obligations on our side um, that we take care of before we can actually um, call the election. All right, so let's go. Um, so the effect of home rule, if we were to give, just kind of put it into context of uh, the budget that we just adopted for the fiscal year 1718, our current year. Um, had we been under the expenditure limitation alternative and had not had our home rule in place, um, we would have had to adopt a budget that was um, two, about $200 million less than we actually adopted um, for this year. So it would cause us to actually have to scrutinize all of our expenses and get it down under within um, the expenditure limitation. And the other thing that it would do is not allow us that contingency amount, that we put that contingency amount into the budget just in case something does happen during the year. If we had a, a natural disaster, a microburst, a flooding, or whatever it is, um, we have that capacity in there. So that's about where we're operating right now is we're real close, which means we don't have that contingency uh, capacity if we were under the um, formula. Um, the home rule election, it is referred to the voters by a two-thirds. It does require two-thirds of the council to refer it to the ballot. Again, it is at a regularly scheduled where we're doing council members or have the potential to be doing council members at that election. And it is approved for four years um, in place. And so the November 18 ballot, if that were to pass as a continuation of the home rule, would be effective for 1920 to 2223, uh, where we'd be covered. Um, again, we came to you early um, because we know there's a lot of topics that we're going to be talking about during this budget cycle, and we didn't want this to kind of get lost in the shuffle. So we came to you really early, kind of before we start the budget process. You really won't hear back from us on this particular topic again until about May, um, when we'll come back and we'll be doing the uh, public hearings in the newspaper or public notices in the newspapers, and then also have two public hearings at council meetings, um, and then we'll be asking you to um, call the election to place it on the November 18 ballot. And with that, are there any additional questions? Doesn't look like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda, item 1C, is to hear a presentation and discuss a proposed memorandum of understanding with developer R3 for a mixed-use development at the Pepper Place parking lot. Jeff McVeigh and Sarah Sorensen, welcome. 
and you brought Tim with you. Good to see you, Sam. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Uh, Jeff McVeigh with the City Manager's Office, Manager of Downtown Transformation. Um, with me today is Tim Sprague representing R Cubed, the developer, and Sarah Sorensen from our Economic Development Office. Uh, this morning, we want to um, present to you the, the business terms of a memorandum of understanding for what is a unique development on a parcel of land um, we are calling the Pepper Place parking lot. Um, this is um, just east of Robeson, um, just south of uh, the Idea Museum. It's just under an acre in size at 38,000 square feet, 38,500 square feet, and currently it has 76 city-owned parking spaces on there. Um, Mostly it's uh, one and three hour parking. There's very few permitted parking spaces on the spot. Um, what is being proposed is an apartment development that's very unique and that's why we've asked Tim to come and present to you um, the concept um, because we think it's something that um, everybody, that you'll be very excited to see. First of all, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, I will tell you that what we're gonna talk about is something very cutting edge. Our firm is a developer of multifamily and hospitality product, Habitat Metro, and we've come up with this concept that we call R-Cubed, which stands for Rethink, Recycle, and Reside. Uh, this is cutting edge sustainability. So if you take a look at the building, uh, the building that we've designed here will be anywhere from six to seven stories in height. Uh, we will be maintaining the parking that is existing there on the Pepper lot, and we will be providing parking for the apartment complex itself. So why is this sustainable? Well, if you look at the top of the building, you can see solar arrays. Uh, we'll have solar energy, and our projections to this point shows that we'll probably be able to provide 85 to 95% of the electrical needs. We'll be looking at the city's uh, utility company for our battery, if you will, for days like uh, today. Um, We'll have a water catchment system where we'll be catching rainwater. We will be catching a lot the last two days. We'll catch some gray water, depending on how the plumbing system is ultimately designed. One of the things we're looking for is a natural swimming pool. I'll show you where its location will be in a moment. Go ahead, if you would, Jeff, and there you go. You see that where it occurs. I'm gonna ask you to go back to the slide before, if you will. One of the things that's really important to us is to make sure that we activate the street, activate Pepper. And along, that, this is the face that would be facing to the north. And we're gonna have approximately 5,000 square feet of retail space that will be creating pedestrian activity on Pepper that you see there at the very base of the building. Uh, every one of the units will be provided with a smart TV. And like a project we just finished uh, earlier this year, uh, we will be bringing in our own fiber to the project. And what that fiber will do is provide high speed, almost commercial grade internet service. And we'll also have a building-wide energy management system. So if you go in your unit, you wake up, you click on the television, the first thing you see will be a measurement of the macro processes of that building, the macro metabolism. Five seconds later, what will pop on the screen is the micro metabolism, which is what you're doing in your unit. How much energy are you saving? How much water are you using? At the end of the month, we'll have a contest for the best, we'll get a free dinner. So this is the concept that we've had. We've designed this building and this concept from the inside out. Normally, someone like me, we take uh, the idea of an elevation from the architect and you kind of go from the outside in. This has been solely designed from the inside out to be able to pay respect to the different sustainable elements that we have and ultimately come up, we think, with the building that's very attractive. This will be a six to seven story building. We'll have a minimum of 70 units. It'll be between 70 and 100 units. That really depends on how the parking is finally laid out. We'll have what we call metro units, which are approximately 500 square feet, going up to 1,250 square foot units. Average size is about 1,000 square, square feet. We'll have lush landscaping. And instead of using potable water, we're gonna be using water catchment sourced water for our landscaping. You'll see landscaping that's vertical on the side of the building, as well as the normal horizontal landscaping that we'll have around the pedestrian walkways. The project will include a good fitness center, uh, and I mentioned uh, commercial activity uh, parking. We will maintain the 76 parking spaces at a minimum for the city, and we'll work with the city if the city desires to have more added, work with them to work with the city in terms of having it added to the project itself. We are very excited about having this occur in downtown Mesa. 
especially because of its location in relation to the Idea Museum and being able to activate what's going on on uh, that part of downtown just north of Main Street. So, Mayor, um, um, as we... Since we're talking about macro and micro metabolism mobility, and you can understand why we had Tim here to explain it, um, <laughs> but now I'd like to, to Sarah Sarah Sorensen with her economic development office. She's been on loan um, for this project, and she's been uh, taking the lead on working through the the business points of the MOU that's in front of you. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Sarah to, to kind of walk you through the the deal points. Sure. So Tim already mentioned a few of these, but um, as usual, we've included the primary deal points within the MOU. Uh, the developer has committed to a minimum of 70 uh, market rate apartments with a focus on sustainability, 5,000 square feet of commercial space. Since the project will be on top of an existing city parking lot, the developer will replace that parking um, for the city at no cost to the city. Uh, the developer will also lease or buy the land from the city. If we proceed with a ground lease with option to purchase, it would be in the form of a long-term lease with a reduced rental rate for the first 15 years. Uh, the reduced rental amount would reflect the benefits the city would be receiving in um, operations and maintenance of city parking, as well as the conversion of surface parking to structural parking. After 15 years, the developer would pay market rate for the remainder of the lease term. This option would also include um, the option to purchase the property at fair market value. If we proceed with uh, a real estate purchase agreement, the purchase price would be at fair market value, which would be adjusted or may be adjusted to include the benefits <coughs> that I just mentioned. Uh, the developer would also have to convey a perpetual easement to the city for our city parking. And under this option, we would consider the use of a GPLET. Um, subject to the terms and limitations, as you know, that's um, current, may be amended in the future. Uh, the developer is also solely <coughs> responsible for the structural and capital repair and replacement of the project. The city's obligations would include either leasing or selling the land under one of the two options that I just mentioned. City parking will remain owned and controlled by the city. We also may consider constructing or reimbursing for public infrastructure subject to a cap, and that would be outlined um, thoroughly in the development agreement. We would also <coughs> consider providing impact fee offsets to account for previous development on the site. Um, many years ago, before it was surface parking, it was the location of a few single family homes, so there is a small impact fee credit that could be applied towards this project. We'll also consider a customized review schedule and an assignment of a DSD project manager to oversee the entitlement process. Lastly, should we need a rezoning to form-based code, we will initiate that rezoning case. Um, however, we don't, we don't anticipate that being the case. Just a few other deal points to mention. Um, like recent MOUs, we've included a provision which allows the developer to design the parking structure to allow for the conversion of additional residential or commercial space as we see the need for parking <coughs> demand decrease. Um, again, the developer would still need to retain all of the city's allocated parking if he chooses to do that. Uh, the city and the developer will also enter into a cost-sharing arrangement for the operations and maintenance of the parking structure. As I mentioned, the first 15 years, it would be the responsibility of the developer to pay all of the operations and maintenance costs. After the 15 years, the city would pay for the O&M of its parking spaces. The developer would pay for the O&M of its parking spaces, and we would work out a shared agreement to cover the O&M for the shared drive aisles. The MOU also states that the project will use City of Mesa utilities since it is within our service area. However, we will also consider um, an accommodation where the developer would independently purchase electricity from a renewable energy source. And lastly, uh, the, the MOU expires on December 31st, 2018, this year. So we are recommending that uh, city Council approve the uh, or authorize the city manager to enter into the MOU so the staff can begin working on the development agreement. And with that, are there any questions? Yes, Jeremy. I have one question. Can you go back to that previous slide? 
the consideration for options to provide electricity from a renewable energy source, can you elaborate on that? Yes. As I mentioned, this, the focus of this building is sustainability. Uh, if we have the opportunity to produce more energy off-site because of the, the footprint of the building itself is limited to just, just about an, an acre, if we have the ability to access that, we would look at working with the City of Mesa uh, utility company to be able to wheel that energy to the site and basically pay some kind of a transmission fee to the city to be able to use that energy. Okay. So you would be bypassing the city of Mesa uh, electric company essentially to go and purchase wholesale If solar. we did that, because we, we were looking at, at, at studies, and I, I will tell you, Councilman, that that's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. It's something we're looking at. But what we would be doing would be paying a transmission fee to use the city's grid. And in terms of we would be bypassing the source of energy, if you will. Will the details of that be worked out in the MOU, or is that just a broad statement that says that you have the ability to obtain energy from somewhere else? I wish I could say that they'll be completely worked out. Uh, to be candid with you, I doubt that we'll know exactly how that would work. But we'd give you the option to come back at Correct. another time. To come back and negotiate that, right. I guess my question would be, from the city's perspective, what are we being locked into as far as an agreement mm -hmm. goes on the energy side? Mayor, uh, uh, Councilmember Whitaker, we're being locked into having the discussions. It's just open to the idea and, to present and, something to us. And okay. it's an agreement to agree in the future. We understand that. Fair enough. Uh, the other question I have is, is this development contingent on the city uh, building out the ASU project, or is this project moving forward regardless? I wish it was. No, it's not, sir. Not at all. We think that the market, uh, when the time that this project is finished, the market's going to be absolutely ready for what we're doing. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> I have a couple questions. This is very exciting, uh, a very green project that I think uh, you'll fill it up uh, immediately because there's a, a, quite a demand for, for this type of a housing uh, product. But uh, from the city perspective, I think what we're uh, giving up is potential. Well, we're not giving it up, but we have a parking lot. And we, that, that's a, an important uh, service to provide for the merchants that are on Main Street and also for our facilities, for the Idea Museum and the other things on Pepper Street. So uh, we aspire to have a parking problem in downtown Mesa. Uh, and I think we're getting closer. Uh, as, as I drive by the Pepper Street surface lot, to me it seems like it's usually pretty full of cars. Uh, it, can you tell me, are, are, are we near capacity on that lot now, and if so, uh, is it good enough to just replace that lot with the existing number of places, or do we need to, as part of the steel, say we don't need 76 parking spaces, we need, you know, 150? The majority, Mayor, the majority of those parking spaces are actually not decaled spaces. They are open spaces used um, by downtown visitors, downtown customers. So um, we, we could do a parking study and take a closer look at um, the actual need. But right now, that parking is predominantly used by visitors and um, customers to the downtown shops. What's the, uh, is it half full? I mean, do, do, do we monitor what the, what the need is and what the capacity is and whether we, and do we project it? Uh, have we done parking need uh, projections? Mayor, we do monitor the number of decals that are issued, and it is a relatively low number, comparatively speaking to the number of <clears throat> spots available. Um, but we could take a, a closer look and adjust that number if, if we need to. And so, Mayor, uh, we, we, did have a, we did have a parking study completed um, by a consultant last year, um, and they did do a lot of, um, of a of analysis, so we can get to you. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but they did have utilization um, analysis that we can get that in numbers to you. But I do believe it was actually, from a time of day, it was actually pretty high, as it are most of our parking lots in downtown. The, the utilization was pretty high. Yeah, yeah. yeah I guess that, that's, I love this project. My only concern is 10 years from now, I don't want us to say, dang it, you know, we're, we have a huge, we have a parking problem in downtown Mesa and we don't have the ability to do anything about it because we now have a beautiful apartment complex on top of our parking lot. Okay. I, Mr. Think, Mayor, we, I think we look at lots of other opportunities in the downtown, <clears throat> better utilization for parking. Frankly, the discussion nationally and internationally about parking garages is they may become the dinosaurs of, of the past just because of the autonomous vehicle concepts. And so, you know, maybe not 10 years from now, but 15 or 20 years from now, it may be a very different perspective about parking garages. So um, 
I think we're seeing the trend at large events. I've talked to the, met, talked to the city manager of Scottsdale. Their mega events are seeing lower and lower parking, but more and more queuing of you know, um, you know, vehicles, the Uber and Lyft. So it's it's kind of it's changing kind of the way things are looked at as far as parking a car and letting it sit there all day long um, and looking for more efficiency of transportation purposes. I understand the, the, the trend that uh, parking lots may be obsolete mm -hmm. at some point, but uh, I just want to make sure that we're not. Yeah, I think there are uh, options in the downtown. We can look at yeah. and, and if I can add, Mayor, um, as part of the parking study that we had completed, and we can share that with the entire council, um, our consultant, even though our parking looks um, as if it has a pretty high utilization rate, our consultant was very clear throughout that parking study that we have sufficient parking in our downtown to accommodate quite a bit of development before we need to start thinking about um, new parking. Um, we haven't even really started scratching the surface of oversubscribing over our parking um, so that it becomes a, more, a, a greater demand on the number of spaces. Right now it is convenient, so you do see a lot of cars parked there for for a long period of time, but if we started making it, you know, started getting into maybe some bigger city um, um, actions for parking, you know, whether it's um, more 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 subscription or, or or meters or things along that line, um, we could see more turnover and 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 be able to accommodate quite a bit into the future. Well, and, and another question I'm anxious to hear from Mr. Luna, but another related question. This is also, I think, utilized by the uh, IDEM Museum, they, uh, and there has been some discussion of expanding the footprint of the IDEM Museum and encroaching on their parking, which might create the need for additional parking across the street. So I just want to make sure we're we're aware of that and figuring calculating that into our parking needs, Mr. Luna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brig Mr. Sprague, for making a commitment to come to Mesa. We also aspire for market rate housing in the area. So I'm, and, I'm, and you've done a tremendous job in the Phoenix area with your project there. What kind of market analysis um, do we have that some assurances that we're going to be able to fill that building with, with uh, many residents wanting to live in the downtown area? Well, the market analysis that we have now is one that we've done internally our, ourselves and looking at what kind of projects are being forecasted to come in and, and where we think the market is here. Is, is downtown Mesa is experiencing this, this is the chicken or the egg issue. Do you have the commercial here? Do you have the residential here? And each is kind of dependent upon, upon the other. Uh, we think very seriously because of the difference uh, that this uh, particular de development has compared to the rest of the community at large, and I say the, the valley, that this will be a real attractor just because of that. Um, it's not as if we're putting in 200, 300 apartments. We're talking about 70 to 100 units and something that really is focused upon something that I think will appeal to, to, to a really particular group of people. So what's the timeline, Just I mean, we've got some big, we can either rent it or sell it. I mean, there's some major decisions to be made here <coughs> before you move forward. What, what's the timeline? Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, for the MOU, uh, it will be on agenda for your action um, on February 26th. Um, should you um, approve the MOU, we'll probably move straight into starting to negotiate the development agreement and lease and or purchase agreements depending on which route we go. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Sprague, for coming to downtown Mesa, mm -hmm. bringing a great project. We appreciate Thank you. it. Okay. Uh, the next uh, agenda item on our for our meeting today is to hear a presentation and discuss a proposed inter intergovernmental agreement with Arizona State University for the development, operation, and maintenance of educational facilities in downtown Mesa. Gentlemen, welcome. Mayor, I'm just sticking around today. Um, Appreciate it. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be presenting uh, the broad terms of a of an intergovernmental agreement with ASU um, for bringing a ASU presence into our downtown. Um, this is a follow-up to the effort from 2016. However, this is a, 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 a very scaled back um, version of what you saw previously. Um, we could uh, estimate it to be about half of the size of what was previously proposed. Um, previously, uh, we talked about doing phase development as we are still talking about doing today. Um, that, however, the first phase previously in 2016 included two buildings of approximately 180,000 square feet. Currently, um, we're talking about the design and construction of a building that ranges somewhere between 100 and 125,000 square feet. 
Um, as part of this MOU, the city would have the obligation to do the design and construction of that building as well as, as uh, tenant improvements, essentially bringing it up to the warm shell status. Um, ASU would be responsible for furniture fixtures and equipment. Um, and in addition to that, we would also be responsible for that first phase of the city center park, um, the urban plaza, which would, would be about two acres in size. What I failed to put on this slide that, that, that I also want to mention is that on that site plan, you, what you see is building D. That is our, our, our IT building that is currently being, um, uh, all, IT is moving all of their equipment out of there um, and will become uh, available for other uses. Um, this uh, MOU would also commit the city to, to building out of 6,000 6, square feet or so of that IT building for innovation space, what we're, we're, we're calling today as innovation studios. Um, and you'll see later on in the presentation about some of the programming that we're, we're expecting from ASU as part of this project of how those two things can tie together. Um, if we move forward with the first phase, ASU would be committing to 750 students and 40 faculty and staff within five years of opening. Um, they would be bringing um, an expanded film program, but they would also be um, creating new programming um, within this uh, location that doesn't currently exist in ASU. Um, I've listed the names there, but in just a minute, I'm going to hand the, uh, the time over to Rick Namark with ASU to, to actually discuss those programming and, and, uh, and present that to you. Um, based on the, the, the size of the buildings that we're talking about, say 100,000, 115,000 square feet, ASU is able to estimate what their, what their build-out cost would be. Um, so that would be around $10 million for a 115,000 square foot building just in furniture, fixture, and equipment. Um, in addition, they would have approximately $1.3 million in annual O&M cost. Um, just like the last time around, uh, ASU would be committing to funding a reserve and replacement fund, which would cover the cost of large capital expenditures. Say if you an air conditioner cooler went out or something like that, then that would be used to, um, the money would come out of the reserve and replacement fund. Um, in addition, um, the MOU would include multiple events yearly that are open to the public, um, film screenings, um, um, seminars on, on innovation and entrepreneurial support, um, and as well as uh, ASU is committing to, to be an active member um, of our innovation district as we continue to build that. Um, if, and if we form a committee, um, which uh, there will be a presentation to the council study session next week, um, in the formation of that committee, ASU will, have, will, will, will assign a staff member to that committee, and that will be a, a, a dedicated staff member that will, will, will really um, be a key role for, for the development of the innovation district. And now, Rick, I'm going to hand over to Rick to, to really explain what these new and, new and innovative programs um, that they're proposing to bring to Mesa. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. Thanks for inviting us back. Um, and uh, for people who don't know me, my name's Rick Namark. I'm Associate Vice President in the University Planner's Office. And uh, with me here as uh, part of our team, Angela Creedon, Ward Nichols, whom you know, but I especially want to introduce Jake Pinholster. Jake, wave your hand. Jake is the um, associate uh, dean and is an associate pre professor in the Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts. Jake and his boss, Dean Stephen Tapper, have been assigned by President Crow to be our lead in thinking about what kind of academic programs are going to uh, be here if you choose to help us uh, with these facilities. And um, so if you have more detailed questions about the technology or whatever, I'm going to have to ask Jake to come up to explain that. Um, as, as you know, we're already a, a big part of uh, Mesa's story in Councilman Thompson's district. We're uh, rocking and rolling at the, at the Polytechnic campus, and it's doing very, very well. Um, but. Uh, as you also know, ASU is an institution that's very focused on innovation, on entrepreneurship, and community impact. And you can imagine, given what you all have been talking about, about transforming your downtown into uh, an innovation district, is something that we, of course, uh, at your invitation, would want to be a, a part of. So we spent a lot of time thinking uh, about how, in this new framework, and the smaller scope that Jeff described of the, of the initial phases, um, how, how we would uh, engage our academic and research programs and our entrepreneurship and innovation programs uh, in this area. And in fact, we actually spent a whole day uh, with a number of a uh, academic research uh, industry folks um, 
Jeff actually attended with us, so he got to watch the sausage but, uh, being made. But you know, basically what we did is uh, took this diverse group of people who were really experts in the fields that we wanted to, to, to think about for here. And there was an amazing consensus among them about the direction that we ought to head as a university if we have this opportunity uh, to, to work with you here, and, and particularly in this location. So uh, we, we want our academic program, as many of our academic programs are, to be um, to, to cross disciplines. And uh, here is a slide that says, you know, we're crossing between film and media and gaming, but we intend to go beyond that. And I, I just want to mention this because I, I'm not sure people know, but um, we have uh, the fastest growing and most diverse film program in the country. And the largest number of students who would actually be down here at this facility uh, and engage would be upper division majors uh, and others who are uh, connected to the Bachelor of Arts in Film program that we have, particularly those with concentration in film and media uh, production. Our ASU students produce uh, more than 350 film projects a year, including you know, documentaries, uh, animated uh, films, uh, music videos, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the fusion of the technologies and knowledge across <coughs> these disciplines and other things that I'm going to talk about here, along uh, with elements from architecture and design, which are also within the Herberger Institute, are really what are going to make this program unique and new for ASU, but also unique uh, across the nation and really catapult the program into some new dimensions. So, um, so we're talking about employing some modern tools here, uh, advanced visualization, augmented reality, prototyping, uh, among a few. And Mesa already has little, little grains of some of those uh, activities here. For instance, I noticed you have a prototyping festival. Our goal is not just about educating our students or doing additional research, but really to advance solutions to complex challenges. Uh, for industry, community, and individuals using these and other tools. And we'll draw on our academic and, and uh, research uh, resources, not just from the Herberger Institute, but from our, our colleges and schools, such as engineering, sustainability, public policy. So students in these programs will have an opportunity not just to major in, in film or major in game design or something like that, but also be an engineering major, perhaps, with a concentration in designing uh, design futures. That's an element that we hope to bring in from several of our, our colleges, and we're just beginning to think about how, how that will work. We're also planning to develop some completely new programs, um, interdisciplinary degrees that do not exist today within the Herberger College, really focused on experience design. And uh, that was a term I'd heard but really didn't, didn't know a lot about. Uh, at its core, it's the idea of using technology and human-centered design principles to create comprehensive user experiences. You can't see it on this slide, but see the UX? That's right in the middle. It's all about designing user experiences. And they may relate to products or services or events or environments. So. Uh, there are applications throughout uh, every industry. Think about air transportation or housing development. I was actually, I'm not a huge sports fan, except for tonight, there is a basketball game I'm gonna watch. But the Neymar household loves the Olympics. And last night as I was watching um, Michaela Schifrin come down the slopes in the uh, giant slalom, I was thinking to myself, how does this apply to that? And Think about all the different ways. I'm watching it on TV. Changing the experience of how I interact, just you know, watching it on TV. Changing the experience of the people who were there at the Olympics, watching the Olympics, the experience uh, that they will have there. Changing the design of the facilities or the, um, the uh, arenas where they're doing their, uh, their work based upon all of these technologies, or even training uh, for these athletes. Imagine if they were able to train with environments that were created here in Mesa to help them uh, better understand how to react to 
a wind gust that might come up or whatever. Uh, so almost anything you think about can be, can be affected by experience design. Next slide. So uh, by bringing those disciplines, our academic research and technology rich resources here, we'll be able to attract students from all over the world to this high volume, creative, and entrepreneurial environment. But in addition to the academic world uh, taking notice, we also want to make sure that we're equally engaged with corporate partners here and elsewhere, large and small, small innovators in the community who are looking to test and advance ideas will have access to these facilities. And we want to be accessible to community organizations and the residents of Mesa who simply want to engage in this environment, whether it's by attending a film, hanging out to observe the creative process, or discovering their own hidden talents. <coughs> so it goes without saying that uh, also bringing this kind of university activity to this part of Mesa will also be transformative in terms of bringing new investment, more projects like the project Tim just talked about. And while it may not be contingent on ASU coming here, I will tell you every developer who you've talked to about developing in Mesa has talked to me about what is ASU thinking about? Because uh, that's what happened in downtown Phoenix. Uh, ASU coming there transformed the environment for investment. And then finally, the most important part is people. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, we have some minimum numbers that, that we're required to meet here as a part of this agreement. But this is going to create a buzz and a lot of people coming to and engaging with this part of your community like never before. And uh, so we would love to be part of that story. Um, uh, we, again, we were invited here to be a part of the story. We're not trying to force ourselves here. And it might not even naturally happen if you didn't ask us to, to engage and put our minds to it. So I'll be happy to answer questions when Jeff is done uh, with his part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, Mayor, uh, Council, the, this, uh, the MOU deal points also include provisions for future phases of ASU. Um, this, is, this is really kind of uh, hearkening back to the previous um, IGA that we had with ASU that, that had two additional phases beyond the, the first phase. Um, at that time, uh, we were talking about a funding source that made it much more likely that those phases could happen. So this is a bit different um, from what you've previously seen. Um, but the key points are that, that should the city um, choose to move forward at the city's discretion, council's sole discretion to move forward to fund an additional phases of ASU, there would be additional buildings. Um, they're shown as building B and C on, on the site plan. Um, the square footages are shown on the slide. But the important part is that if city funds additional um, development, um, ASU is showing that there are some triggers that are happening as well. Um, we want to tie this to um, economic development activities and that we can, can truly show that new developments has happened in the downtown area because ASU has, has shown, has, has arrived. So there would be a trigger of five new developments in downtown before the city would commit to moving forward with additional phases. Um, in, the, in the event that the city is unable to, to is unwilling or unable to move forward with additional phases, we have written into this IGA um, the option for ASU to move forward on their own, to, to fully fund and design the construction of either buildings B or C on their own, um, as long as it's consistent with our master plan and, and provided the city council gives them approval to do so. In those future phases, um, just like we had previously um, put together, um, as additional square footage is brought online, um, ASU would be committing to additional, uh, additional students and additional faculty and staff. Um, they would continue to provide um, the build out of the new buildings, uh, and they would also continue to be the solely responsible for the, the operations and maintenance of those buildings. Um, in addition, they would continue to have the responsibility to, to fund a reserve and replacement fund, as well as continue to have those public events um, that are available not only for their students, but also for the general public residents of Mesa. Uh, and they would continue to be an active member of, on, any, um, on any activities related to the Innovation District. Um, 
there are some some additional commitments that are that I'm considering cooperative commitments that are included in the IGA. I've highlighted two of them that are, I want to focus on because those two are 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 additional decision points. So if council decides to move forward with an IGA with ASU, it doesn't mean that we're done there. There is there's going to be multiple times that, that it will require concurrence from the city and from the council in order for the project to move forward. Um, Importantly of those, uh, of those decision points, the master plan and design guidelines, we have to come to an agreement on how the, how the city center block is gonna look. And then um, very key to this discussion is the project budget. Um, previously, we had done quite a bit of work um, on, on actually creating estimates for cost um, for the buildings because um, we had to have those numbers to include into a, a, an election. Um, this time around, the market has changed a lot. We've scaled down the, the project um, construction costs are um, are changing every day, um, so we are. Um, if, if we move forward, the first step would be to actually start doing some initial design, um, so that we can come up with um, some estimates of cost, and then we have to come back, sit, sit at the table, and actually agree to a project budget before we ever move forward again. And that would be another decision point for council. Um, so the big level, high level terms, um, we are discussing, what we're talking about for the financing of the project would be through municipal bonds, um, primarily tax free municipal bonds, but there would be some consideration built in the IGA um, related to um, taxable municipal bonds because, just because we don't know how much um, potential retail square footage there could be on the first floor. And if we, we exceed a certain threshold, um, that would take the entire project into a taxable. So we're gonna look at that very closely to make sure that we're not gonna cause, would, would not cause any problem with our bonding. Um, the term of the lease would be a 99 year lease and it's a lease versus a purchase. Um, that lease could be extended by ASU should they have uh, certain capital expenditures. If they have to spend, um, uh, um, $100,000 on new chillers, and those chillers have an expected life of 15 years, then we would look at extending the lease by, by 15 years to match the expenditure or the capital investment that they, that they made. Um, in addition to the, the O&M costs that ASU is covering that we previously discussed, um, they would also be paying the city $100,000 a year in rent, as well as reimbursing the city for the cost of a salary or the prorated costs of a city employee um, that is responsible for the, for the site for overseeing the O&M from the city's perspective. Um, there is potential for additional city revenues coming from commercial subleases, um, from additional permitted parking, or, and or the, the sale of utilities to the building. So with that, we're happy <coughs> for discussion and questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Brady, I did not hear any reference to numbers. And so as I, to help me, as I understand this, the, the the proposal that's, uh, that we're working on now for the IGA, the Intergovernmental Agreement, is to authorize you to engage in the due diligence of, of working with ASU to develop a budget and to have cost estimates. And uh, entering into this Intergovernmental Agreement does not uh, bind us to uh, expenditures. It, it binds us to discussions to develop uh, estimates of what the expenditures would be. Am I, am Mayor, I understanding that yeah, correctly? Mayor, that's correct. I think Jeff alluded to the fact that there's some, um, we need to move forward. If we're going <coughs> to consider uh, this project, substantial project, uh, one of the things we need to put together is the master plan for the entire campus area so we can make sure we understand mm -hmm. the dynamics of that and how we um, ad address issues about the setbacks of facilities, the ingress and egress, and just uh, dealing with the existing operations, municipal operations in this site, and also anticipating future growth. So that's one of the, the checkpoints we have to go through. Um, and then, it, as you mentioned, we have um, we have to go through a process of selecting a design team and maybe even a contractor to a point so that we can come to, to an agreement on the project budget. Um, so we, um, ha we don't have a number today. We have estimates. You've seen the numbers as far as the... Uh, square footage that we're attempting to try to get to because we believe that's an important um, number that helps associate that allows ASU to bring in all the programs they're speaking to but and we need to spend some time soliciting through RFPs and others to um, uh, acquire uh, design consultants and engineers there'll be a lot of um, vetting that has to go we'll have to spend some dollars on that side just to engage um, the consultants to help us with that. 
And then when the project budget will have to be an agreed upon term between the both parties, um, and then we'll certainly have to bring that back to council. And once we have that number, then obviously we'll speak to um, what that number is, as well as um, any proposed methods for uh, financing that. In my mind, it seems somewhat similar to the process that, you've, uh, that we've authorized you to go through with regard to the Youth and Amateur Sports Project, where you have uh, incurred some fees and done some due diligence to tell us so, so that when we have our strategic planning session, when we entertain the idea of uh, perhaps a park bond to pay for some of these improvements, we have hard numbers in front of us that we uh, can use as we right. determine it's, it's our, just, our priorities. And, you know, we had in the previous go around, we had that opportunity to do that um, in advance of the um, putting the items on the ballot. And so we, ha we had to go through some of the same processes as established project budgets. Uh, we didn't get into all the full detail. Um, but um, we've, this is kind of the pattern we've used um, over and over again and how we finance large economic development projects. We need some time. We want to, before we go spend a lot of resources and a lot of effort, and I think both ASU uh, needs that guidance um, that we'll be seeking from council in a couple of weeks, that we're going to move forward um, in this general direction, but recognizing we'll always have to come back to council with project budgets and the master plan. Okay. Thank you. Well. Um, I have been outspoken in my support of this uh, this concept. I think we particularly, uh, that's only become, I think, more uh, of a conviction on my part in the last uh, couple of months as we've uh, explored the Innovation District downtown, had Brookings come out and, and tell us that they see the real potential for our, our downtown. And one of the missing pieces, one of the few missing pieces that we have in our downtown is an anchor institution, an anchor research institution that spins off business, that attracts business. Uh, and I, I uh, as has been alluded to, the, the development community is a buzz waiting for that to happen. Uh, and once it does happen, I think we're going to see, uh, I don't think, I, I'm, very, I'm confident we're going to see the, the potential of our downtown come to fruition uh, step by step. I mean, we could, we could talk about all the different pieces of property, all the different uh, city buildings that could be repurposed for other uses. Uh, to facilitate something that's going to bring a lot of people, a lot of economic activity downtown. I know during the previous consideration of, of the ASU concept, we did do an economic impact study, uh, and I believe that impact study is still relevant to this project as well. You just, I, I believe, would reduce the, the, the amount of uh, investment, and obviously then that would reduce the amount of return. But my understanding of that economic impact statement, uh, if you applied it to this project, scaled, the scaled back project, we're still talking about a billion dollars in return of economic activity uh, in our downtown that would be attracted to our downtown as a result of this investment. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's wise to pursue, to engage in the more detailed negotiations with ASU, that the concept of what they're bringing is also very exciting. Uh, and I pre someone who's 58 years old, you can't have to explain to me what gamification is. Uh, but the more I've learned about that, for, for example, the reason Boeing is calling saying we're interested in this is because they have a list of, I think, 10 or 12 schools that Boeing can, can hire engineers from. ASU is prominent on that list. And they've said to me, we're in the flight simulator business. That's gamification. That is, you know, the, the uh, experience design, the augmented reality. Uh, so I think we're just scratching the surface here of what this could be and, and the attention that it might bring to, to downtown Mesa and the potential for corporate partnerships that would create this anchor institution that would be a magnet <coughs> for economic activity uh, and ultimately pay significant financial returns to our economy. Um, so I see a lot of, uh, we, we will continue to have many discussions about this and this will be a very transparent process and before a dime is authorized or a dime is spent, everybody in the city would, would be sick of talking about this. So I, I promise you that nothing is, is going to happen uh, without a very transparent process before those types of serious commitments are made. But uh, I'm supportive of moving forward. I know today is not an action item, but Mr. Brady, we are talking about on at the end of the last uh, meeting of this month, there will yeah. be something on our agenda. Yeah, we understood this is somewhat new to some of the members of council and it was bringing back this, this project that's been discussed for some time. So we wanted to come as er early in this process to give the council an opportunity to um, hear from us. Um, it won't, uh, we anticipate um, that being on the February 26th agenda. Um, so we have another Thursday 
um, if there's any follow-up questions, it'll, because it'll be on that agenda. Um, so we just want to make sure we get the information out um, early as possible so that there's an opportunity for the council and the community to hear the direction that we're um, headed in. So the item on the 26th agenda will be authorizing you to execute an intergovernmental agreement with ASU along the terms that we've just discussed for, for fleshing out this project and, and doing the due diligence to see what the actual costs and, and, and what the actual commitments on the part of the city and the university would be. Yes, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Council, uh, but we do have a, a request to speak, but prior to that, uh, are there any questions for these gentlemen? Yes, Chris. A uh, quick question for Mr. Brady. How does this deal compare to what we did with Benedictine? Okay, let me think this through. Um, so with Benedictine, um, the city, um, the building was already existed. So we have, uh, there was no, um, so the, the building was in place. Um, so we, um, the city came in and made uh, major renovations to the building uh, consistent with um, collaboration with Benu, Sarah, where is Sarah still here? How much did we spend on that building? $10 million. Um, so that doesn't include the building itself. Um, and um, then Benu obviously has come in and they um, provided the furniture and equipment for that building. And how would the financing of that project compare to oh, this one? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, so um, the timing of that project, um, we had um, in our enterprise fund, had just ex um, had the opportunity, so this was four <coughs> years ago, maybe five years ago that we did this, I think. Um, at that time, there was some significant <coughs> changes in the um, credit market and we were able to refinance um, some outstanding bonds in the enterprise fund. And with that significant savings, which I believe was $60 million or so, um, we were able to take a portion of that and use those dollars to um, fund the improvements both. And I re remember, I think we, it was both for the 225 as well as for the Mesa Center for Our Education. Because remember at that time we had multiple uh, universities are looking at. So we actually use the funds for all those higher education to renovate the 225 as well as the Mesa Center for Higher Education. So we took savings that had been realized through some um, refinancing uh, to help make those payments. And with the municipal bonds, would that result in a tax increase for our residents if we were to issue those? No, it would come out of the enterprise fund. Um, that, that's what we anticipate. Uh, that we would just, as we've done in our, we call it our economic investment fund. It's the same fund where we've funded um, spring training facilities, uh, um, uh, convention centers. There's a whole list of things that we've used it to help reinvest in economic development projects for the city. And just like um, Benedictine and the Mesa Center for Higher Education, that's the same source we set aside. We've identified funds that go into this economic investment fund when, uh, when those opportunities come. And so we anticipate that we would do the same thing um, that we would see that there's an opportunity both from, I think, a three-pronged opportunity um, with the, since the enterprise fund is supported significantly by our utilities, um, we do believe that by the investment of uh, projects like ASU, like the Innovation Studios, just like we've done for Benedictine, it does create, um, stimulate more development in downtown, which then creates more activities for our utilities. We've also um, are completing um, some opportunities. Well, we've already done some refinancing since our uh, last time with council and enterprise funds. We're realizing some savings in our um, outstanding debt obligations. So there's some savings there. And then third, we have experienced um, some significant growth and um, higher than anticipated growth in our utility accounts um, with all the activity, especially in the industrial and manufacturing. Um, so we're seeing a very robust opportunity in that, um, again, in the enterprise fund that we think would um, be able to absorb um, a cost, um, an annual cost that we could use to leverage um, the capitalization of this project. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Uh, Rick, what type of students would ASU be bringing, undergraduate or graduate students? It would be, uh, Mayor, Councilman, it, it would be a mixture. It'll be mostly upper division undergraduate students, so juniors and seniors, although I think everybody would be out here at times. Um, but there are some graduate programs that also would be a part of it. 
I mentioned the establishment of a new grad program that we intend to create. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Um, you know, I, I know one of the things that I've been a huge proponent of is, uh, and that we've been trying to do is really make our downtown a transformational um, area uh, to bring more development and economic development and, and growth into, into downtown. Um, and to follow up kind of like in line with um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Glover's comment, you know, the, the upper level, I guess my concern is if we're doing upper level and grad students, upper level undergrads and grads, they're not really gonna stay in our downtown. Um, and for me, I would like to see more um, programming that would keep kids or keep the young adults in our downtown where they're frequenting our, our shops, where they're frequenting our coffee shops, the you know Desert Eagle or, or the restaurants or what have you, that they're staying in our downtown and not you know, uh, coming down, taking a class, and jumping on light rail and heading back to Tempe to, to take another class. So if there's an opportunity where we can work um, with Ben U and with MCC on, on some programming um, for your core curriculum classes so that you are drawing the freshman and sophomore uh, and not just the upper level uh, juniors and seniors, I think that would be, to me, that would be a little more trans transformational for our downtown. Um, the you know, um, with the municipal bond, with the enterprise fund, I, I, I think I would be um, okay with that on um, going forward with uh, a city-owned facility, um, whether it's the facade of Building D, um, cleaning that up, fixing that up, and doing some of the, the interior. But I'm not um, a big fan of building new um, with... with uh, with our public dollars, um, I like the idea of an Irving, Irving planning. But you know, to the to the previous presentation, we were talking about parking. Um, is that going to be an issue in our downtown? And and looking at you know the urban plaza uh, completely eliminates all of our uh, on property parking. Um, and so we really need to look at that, uh, especially if we're going to be eliminating or taking over parking for Pepper Place. Um, and also for the, um, the rent, $100,000 $100, a year over 99 years is $9.9 million. I, I don't necessarily know that that even scratches the surface of paying the interest on uh, whatever the bond uh, would be. And then the reimbursement of the salary of a city facilities manager, is that also include the legacy cost of that uh, employee? It's fully loaded, right? Yes, it's not, it's not just salary. Benefits and salary, yeah, salary and benefits. And that retirement as well. Mr. Luna. Uh, to me, this is a real exciting venture to be able to have a research hub as Arizona State University. It's been very transformative in the downtown area of, of Phoenix. So to me, that's very exciting to have a research anchor located in Mesa. It's very compelling to me. I'm curious to know how you plan or hopefully plan as you develop your programming, working with CAHOOTS, who is certainly uh, one of those agencies or, or facilities that's going to create some innovation. I would be interested in, in perhaps maybe Jake speaking up about that and how they plan to integrate the two. Um, so, so that's something that I think that needs to be worked out, but I think that's going to be key as we look at this innovation district uh, in terms of moving forward. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Councilman. Uh, sort of going back to Councilman Thompson's point about the existing building over here, yeah. the old IT building that Jeff mentioned. So my understanding of what Mesa wants to do with that is is to you know make that kind of an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, hub, uh, innovation center, and that it wouldn't be an ASU center, right. but that we would we would play and help. Uh, help both for the planning of the physical aspects of that and and the programming there. So we would be an active participant connected to that activity if our academic and research mm -hmm. uh, e energies are planted here in, in that new building. Um, we have a whole team of people at ASU that their entire focus is engagement with uh, people in the corporate world, people in uh, that are starting companies. Uh, some of you have met Jimmy Choi. She was on your panel for um, the uh, 
the Brookings event a, a few weeks ago. Um, that's kind of her, her space, but there's a whole team of people at ASU and mm -hmm. our uh, knowledge enterprise uh, development area who are focused on how do we engage with the larger economic community mm -hmm. to help create training programs, uh, help people understand how to take an idea and turn it into a business. Um, and, and as I said before, the accessibility of our, our facilities and our programming to those businesses is very important. So you could look at the Chandler Innovation Center as an example of that. Mm -hmm. You can look at Sky Song mm -hmm. as an example of that. You can also, uh, in downtown Phoenix now, our folks are engaging with some of the co-work spaces like Cohoots mm -hmm. as a partnership with the city to help create programming to, to, to do that mm -hmm. kind of work. So it, 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 what we do is we help create the ecosystem that helps a Cohoots mm -hmm. be able to uh, attract even more people right. and uh, we sort of play off of one another very, mm -hmm. very, very well. It's a collaborative uh, effort. And I would hope that that you would incorporate some kind of artificial intelligence as we move forward. And since this is an innovative <coughs> hub, that we would move forward in, in that arena. Sure. And one, one other thing I would mention, one of the things we have to figure out as we go along is what equipment mm -hmm. belongs where. Um, so you know, a big motion capture studio uh, might not fit in, a, in, a, in the entrepreneurship center. We might need it for our teaching purposes, but there might be certain nights of the week that it's open for other folks or people could come in and, and engage with, with the, the ASU main, you know, the, the, the ASU mm -hmm. new facilities mm -hmm. as a sort of a connection. So the two buildings are really gonna work together mm -hmm. very well. And I would echo that we would need to support our students, especially the, the younger ones, providing general education opportunities. They all have to have requirements and maybe partnering with Maricopa Community College and offer those classes along mm -hmm. with what you provide as well. And if I, if I may, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, I, I'm just going to add and maybe put a little different spin on, on the cohoots and the, and the innovation space discussion. Um, and, and think about it as a, as a larger ecosystem. And not only will there be opportunities for ASU students to help make, you know, maybe move into cahoots and, and help make cahoots successful, we have to think about how this could be a pipeline, that ASU can be a pipeline into cahoots or into our collaborative space, that, that all of these things together make an ecosystem so that maybe um, we do a better job of capturing the students that come out of ASU, their, their, their businesses and their, their tech entrepreneurs, <laughs> And, and hopefully they stay in Mesa, whether it's downtown or, or the city is at large, and that Cahoots would be a large part of helping keep them in our, in our city. Yes, Jeremy. So uh, currently you and Cahoots have been in Phoenix for uh, about a decade. Uh, can you explain like the top three collaboration efforts that you guys have to date? Um, Mayor and Councilman, I would be glad to come back and, and talk about that next week or the week after or, or separately with you. I don't know the answer to that question right now. Okay. I do know that we engage with a number of, uh, of different co-working uh, spaces. Um, you know, I might turn to Angela. Do you, do you happen to know anything specifically about Cohoots and our interaction? You know, I, I, maybe I can add that when we approached uh, Jimmy Choi to, to uh, be on the panel for the Brookings Institution, we said, who else would be a good person to be on this panel? And she said, well, I'm, si I'm in China right now, and I'm sitting next to Jenny Poon. Uh, we do a lot together. Uh, ASU and Cahoots uh, are very collaborative. Uh, so we, perhaps we could invite one or both of them back to talk about what they were talking about in China together. Yeah, um, Francisco. I think uh, just to comment on the kind of creating pipelines as far as working with businesses, but also with, uh, with uh, Councilman, Vice Mayor Luna and, and the rest, uh, uh, Mesa Public Schools, uh, MCC, you know, working with them, and, and also community organizations, I think you mentioned, uh, who are already here in Mesa that can uh, help be uh, utilize this, these types of facilities perhaps. Uh, but uh, could you elaborate or talk to uh, on the classes piece uh, on the types of degrees? I'm also uh, with uh, Councilman Thompson. I think uh, is, is there a vision of having the, the you mentioned the film school is in Tempe? Uh, you know, having potential 
uh, for those pieces to uh, be in Mesa or have uh, you know a larger footprint, I would say, the degree so that uh, students stay here in the downtown area. I think that's a, a big uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, I was uh, when I started my my master's in uh, in public administration, uh, the ASU started. Uh, to move all their courses to downtown Phoenix, and that I think helped uh, kind of re, re, you know move downtown Phoenix for, uh, further. And then when Walter Cronkite School moved over there and you know, the other schools, I, I think that's uh, I think that's a key here for for Mesa moving these these uh, degrees uh, where uh, the students can take the full courses here in, in downtown is imperative uh, for the future. Uh, of this uh, successful uh, program, so. You know, maybe I can speak to that just a second, and Rick, please uh, add on. I, I can tell you that I had a meeting about a week ago with uh, uh, Maria harper Marinick, the Chancellor of Maricopa County Community Colleges, about uh, what MCC's interest is in, in, in being collaborative with this project. As we all know, MCC owns a large building adjacent to the Mesa Library that they use for classes. They, they partner at, with uh, NAU. The president of NAU was in, involved in the same meeting that I just described. Both of those institutions are very interested in, in, in a two plus two type of an approach where the you know, English 101 and you know, all of the, the, the core curriculum for, for a, a, a bachelor's degree is, is taught very inexpensively and very effectively through the community college system. And, MCC happens to own a large building next door to the building that we're talking about. Uh, and so they are, can I said, may I disclose that we're having these conversations that you're interested in this? And they both said enthusiastically, yes. So I, I think we are just uh, <coughs> scratching the surface here. As the, the commitments are made, you will see an avalanche of other folks that want to be collaborative with this, other uh, education institutions, other businesses, other corporations. Uh, I was talking to Rick, I think, yesterday. No, it was John Graham yesterday who said he, that he just stumbled across a document, <clears throat> maybe 10 or 12 years old, that with the initial pitch for ASU to go to downtown Phoenix. And the expectation <clears throat> of what that was going to be was so modest in comparison to what it actually became, it's just kind of staggering. So I think what the, 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 these are some, some starting points and some minimum commitments that I think years from now, we'll look back and say, wow, we only thought it was this. It ended up being this. Um, it's just my hunch. Rick, can you, do you agree? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman, there, uh, there are a whole bunch of <coughs> ideas that floated through my head as in response to this. First of all, I wanna say that ASU is not just college, right? Our, our mission is about uh, helping create lifelong learning. And we care as much about the pipeline as we do about our graduates, right? So um, it's important to have these kinds of partnerships with community colleges, with high schools. As you may know, we also run high schools. We just launched an online prep academy because our goal is to help Arizonans <laughs> be able to achieve the education they need to be able to thrive in a changing ever-changing uh, workforce. So the connectivity to the other education institutions, I, I absolutely um, underscore. Uh, secondly, we're very focused on impact. And, and wherever our students are, whether they're graduate students, undergraduate students, freshmen, seniors, they, they are connected to the community through community-based projects, through living in community. I, I'm not sure I entirely agree that if we don't bring freshmen and sophomores down here, that people aren't going to stay. And I'll, I'll give you just, just one example. We have graduate program studios, and uh, Jake, Jake has graduate students who are coming to downtown Phoenix for their graduate art studios in the historic warehouse district. You know, they don't just come down there for a couple hours and leave. They live in those studios. They're there all evening. They're there on the weekends. They're part of Art Detour, which is happening in a couple of weeks, where community people come in and look at different galleries and artists. So just as, as one example. Now, we are not, we, ASU has four very large campuses in this valley, one in this city. And we can't recreate a whole 
another whole ASU campus with all of the things that students could get on the Tempe campus or the Poly campus or the downtown campus. It was extremely hard to do that. And even before, with a much more expansive commitment from the city for facilities, we weren't at that time talking about creating a system where you come and you take all of your classes in, in Mesa. Uh, although, uh, we're entertaining some ideas about that for future phases here, and I would never want to rule that possibility out. You will see the impact. I have no doubt in my mind, you will see the impact. The other thing I just want to mention is that our students, we are one university in many places. Our students take classes everywhere. I ride the train from where I live in downtown Phoenix to Tempe all the time. And I'm on there with students, and I'll, I often get into conversations. Um, and many of them uh, take classes at Poly, take classes downtown, and take classes in Tempe. So they're not all stuck in the campus uh, that they're located. They take a schedule that is convenient to them, that is the class that they need or that they want. And we have a, a pretty robust, speaking of the parking situation, we have a pretty robust transportation system. You've probably seen our buses uh, going around as well. The great thing here is it's 20 minutes on the train, too. So if you don't have a car and you don't want to get on the ASU bus, any time of day, at any moment, you can get on that train. And I, the mayor knows, I'm, I, I almost always, not this morning, but almost always take the train when I come to Mesa. So I, I think you've got all the elements of, of that, that uh, impact with the program we've described. And particularly this kind of program is one that attracts people who want to come on the weekends, who want to spend the evenings here. Uh, you know, you're not going to see it just dead at night. <clears throat> to that point, too, McKenna, I had a, a couple of years ago as we were debating this topic, I remember uh, saying, well, no, the ASU said, well, we might want to put some lab space downtown. And I thought, oh, no, we don't want that. We want the, the undergrads coming and buying sandwiches in our downtown. Mm -hmm. And the more I've kind of evolved on this, and, and particularly after the Brookings Institution uh, discussions, I'm thinking, could we have more some lab, some lab space downtown? Because what you're looking for from an economic development point of view is you're looking for the grad students that are going to start businesses and the, the, the professors that are doing consulting work, uh, and more the, the non-teaching professors, those are the people that have the economic impact in your downtown, creating spin-off technologies and startups as opposed to you know, filling uh, sandwich shops with freshmen. Uh, I'm not saying either one is bad. But uh, I think we might be short-sighted if we think that our target is getting undergrads to come in and buy sandwiches before they get on the train and go back to Tempe. Mm -hmm. The bigger economic impact would be lab space, upper division, high technology folks. Then you'll see corporate locations in Mesa tied to those activities. Is Hey, Mayor, can I, um, so let's separate the academic building will have specific purposes that Rick's talked about, but the innovation studio, we want that to be a community collaborative space. So that would include whether you're, regardless of whether you're ASU, MCC, NAU, whatever, it may be somebody who's a, um, an entrepreneur who's already graduated but wants to work on a prototyping using some of the equipment uh, we don't know, but we're thinking that we want this to be, that studio to be that place where a variety of different people can come that don't necessarily have to come credentialed with, you know, a label of a university, but it's a community space. And we are interested in how do we use our coding academies to feed into it um, so that we kind of have this whole system from the beginning of, you know, grade school through middle school and high school that feeds into the whole system. So we're trying to create the whole ecology of this technology environment and not just think about it in terms of, you know, college age students too. So we, we are, as we program this, that's the vision we're having. And remember, we're going to be opening up ThinkSpot in the main library, which is across the street from the innovation studio. So we're trying to think of how can we use that space and those programs to complement and think about how that's going to fit in the studio also. <clears throat> Thank you. Maybe it's obvious to everyone, but just, just for people who aren't, uh, haven't been living with this issue for the last couple of years, tell us about the IT building. Uh, this is not just building a new building. This is activating a, a, a large city of Mesa building that we have kind of outgrown. We, we've, we've relocated all our data, data center operations. Well, break, 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 here's break what's interesting there is in the world of technology, the building has become 
uh, it's more building than we need because all the racks and racks of servers have now been collapsed into much smaller space. We're moving some of that into the cloud and we're actually putting, as we've, I think this council approved, the agreement we have with AT&T just down the street. So we're actually putting our servers literally where the fiber comes in. So we're able to um, consolidate a lot of our operations to the South Center campus. And as a result, we've opened up tremendous amount of um, city-owned space in the ITD building, which was formerly um, the city's main library. And so um, it's an older building. Uh, there, so there's some opportunities for doing improvements. But immediately, we believe kind of in the short term uh, to activate this uh, innovation studio, there is the second floor. And we've had some staff start looking at the possibility, what would it take uh, to um, use this space? And, and while we're waiting for the ASU, or I don't even know if we're waiting for ASU. We, this is something we would do anyway. We decided to do the, the decision with CAHOOTS. This is, again, kind of a space that we think would help feed into the innovation district, creating a technology hub where the community can come together and work on uh, these types of software or equipment. And that's what got um, Boeing very excited uh, when I've met with their general manager, that they would love to be part of this so they could bring some of their equipment and so that they could have students or community members actually getting the experience working on their equipment uh, because they think that exposure will help them ad also identify talent and, and interest in the types of technologies that they're working on. And we hope, and with ASU's commitment to attract other companies to come and be part of that um, environment also. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, Jeremy. Um, I noticed in the presentation, nowhere do we talk about public safety and the need for the increase of uh, police officers and firefighters to support something like this. Um, hoping you guys could just elaborate on the topic. Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Whitaker, um, in our in our IGA, um, I believe what we how we discuss that issue is that ASU is going to be responsible for security on ASU property within the building, and the city and ASU will work together on security for the larger area, but the city would and ultimately have responsibility for the security on the city-owned lot on the city center property. Okay. Some so ASU in, would not take any responsibility for any of the necessity of increased public safety beyond the borders? Outside of the building? Yeah. The property, sure. And we never required that of Benedictine or the other universities, but it's something that we've accommodated through um, allocation of our public safety. I mean, we have, right now today, at Benedictine, we have over 500 students there, and we haven't required them to provide for additional public safety. That's something that the city has been able to manage with its resources. And it, I, one of the big issues that we have, um, I'm sure everybody is aware of, is our uh, unfunded pension retirement system for our public safety officers. And obviously, this is going to require a huge influx of, I would say, at least police officers, right, to be able to man this area. Was that the assumption, or are we just sticking with our current allocation of resources on that side? Well, every year the city has even during the worst times of the recession, we've, we've well, not maybe not every year, but we have been adding officers. And just in the last budget, we added additional officers related to downtown. So we've added bike patrols um, and something that we're, we're trying to address, specifically related to understanding the total numbers related to this project. Um, that's not something we've specifically identified. But in the past, again, what we've seen and realized that with a project like this, is a stimulator of economic development. It brings other activities to the city um, that usually generates um, additional sales tax and property tax, but specifically the sales tax. Um, then that would we would believe that in the future there would be opportunities for us to identify additional resources um, for public safety personnel. So how does it work with ASU and Tempe? I know you guys have like it says like ASU police on the cars. Can you just briefly explain that relationship that you have with Tempe? I'm going to let Angela talk about the Tempe, but while, while she's coming up, let me just mention that in downtown Phoenix, what has happened uh, with the redevelopment of downtown that really occurred as in great part because of the investments in light rail and in uh, the ASU campus, the per capita crime rate in downtown Phoenix is one of the lowest in the entire city. Now, that being said, when you bring a lot of people somewhere, you, like with the events and, and all that, you do need, you do need public safety uh, resources for that purpose. But it's not about crime increasing. It's just about, you know, if you're bringing more people to somewhere, you're going to need more 
uh, public safety resources in general. But the rates are actually down and among the lowest in the city as a result of that kind of revitalization of that, that core area. I was under uh, the impression that the uh, crime rates went up in specific, not to Phoenix, but to Tempe, where you guys are, I mean, that's your home, right? Like, isn't the per capita crime rate in Tempe a lot higher? And the justification for that is the fact that there, there is a huge uh, AS, like the presence of, uh, you know, young college students, or correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know the answer to that. Mayor and Councilmember Whitaker, I haven't seen any numbers that show that there's a, a, a distinction between having a university and having a rising crime rate. Uh, that's assuming that people can identify crime by a student or by a member of the ASU community. In Tempe, we're managing it similar to what uh, the city manager just outlined. We have jurisdiction over university properties, and so we do have a police department that manages those facilities. And then the city of Tempe, we work very collaboratively with their police department on the remaining outside um, public safety needs. Okay. So I just remember, I sat on a jury a long time ago, and I remember that was actually a ASU police officer was the one that arrested somebody for like a DUI or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm assuming that you do, in fact, enforce some of the other Law? Like, how does that... What we that do have the ability to, to operate um, in collaboration with the city of Tempe and enforce when necessary. So okay. that could have occurred on university property. It could have occurred in the city of Tempe. But typically, if uh, I'll use an example of student housing. We have an issue that's a private student housing. There could be the need for additional officers. ASU officers may respond in conjunction with the city of Tempe officers as well. So we, we, that's what I mentioned in terms of collaboration. We try to jointly uh, police as much as possible. So uh, you guys wouldn't oppose, you know, uh, supporting police staff that's necessary, you know, a fully loaded cost of police officers that are necessary to actually enforce in the areas outside of your borders, more geographically, I guess I would say. Are you asking whether we would we would contribute as a part of an agreement to yes. paying for police officers? We, we have not done that. We have to ramp up our own staff and our own police uh, as a part of our being in a, in a place. But we do work very collaboratively. And so um, even in, in Phoenix, as an example, the Civic Space Park was built as a part of the ASU campus, but it's a public park. And the City of Phoenix Police... Um, police that park, City of Phoenix park rangers, and also they have private security for that park. And then our police are also there. So we work collaboratively. It does not cause a big spike in, in your need for public safety resources. If I can chime in real quick, um, a good example is ASU Poly, where the ASU um, police uh, help our police in patrolling throughout the airport, not just on the ASU property, mm -hmm. so um, because they understand that we're undermanned in some respects, and because of the districts that they're serving, five and six combined, are so large that they take that upon themselves. There's a collaboration between Mesa PD and ASU police that they're actually patrolling and, and helping us at, down at the Gateway Airport. We have 5,000 students at ASU Poly? Correct. And that's only in the last six years, and we haven't added police officers just for that area. Okay, great. And, and Mayor, if I may add, uh, also Councilmember Whitaker, I think we have to um, consider the, the larger downtown area. In the last couple months, the council has approved a number of development agreements, MOUs, for new private development that is going to bring thousands of new residents to downtown. And I, I imagine in the future, in, in the next several months, you'll be seeing more of these agreements coming forward. Um, downtown as a whole is going to have a lot more activity um, with people, not just the students. The ASU will become part of of what will be a much more active place. And, and ideally, when we add more people, it just becomes safer. There's more passive surveillance. Um, uh, there's, less, there's less opportunity for crime to happen because there are more eyes on the street. And it's hopeful that as we keep on adding people, whether it's through ASU or through private development, that downtown is just going to become a safer place. So the ratio of police officers to citizens goes down as we increase the population? Is that what you're suggesting? I don't know where to speak to that. I mean, we, we're able to manage it. I do think that um, we have seen that in areas that are not as populated, where you have a lot of vacant land and alleyways, um, that some, it does help 
when there are more people uh, around the area um, that are there all times of the day. Now, I don't want to suggest we don't need poli more police officers. We could use more police officers in downtown today um, with, for a variety of issues. And I, I think that's something that we'll have to continue to manage with our limited resources. We need more police officers. And we could point to a variety of different variables that um, change the need for officers. It could be, you know, infill development, but it also could be um, changing demographics. It could be a variety of different things um, that we would need to consider. Yeah, I guess my only point is, you know, when we look at our half a billion dollars in unfunded pension liabilities and uh, an organization like ASU that's sitting on roughly, what, a billion dollars in cash, you know, how can we offset some of that cost from the city perspective so that uh, ASU can help us if this is going to be a mass influx. And I would be interested to see the studies as far as what happens uh, in Tempe or Phoenix, for that matter, when the increased uh, population. But I'm sure you guys are doing your due diligence on your side anyways, Joe. So. Kevin? Uh, and I think to my call, to Council Member uh, Whitaker's um, point, too, is you know, I would love to see some collaboration between ASU and, and our PD in our downtown. If, if we're going to have a campus downtown, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to have um, ASU police as, uh, as part of that for security reasons, and I would love to see that kind of collaboration um, uh, with, our, with our very own PD in our downtown area so that we, we are working hand-in-hand -hand to prevent uh, any type of uptick, um, how minimal it may be in, in crime or petty theft or whatever it may be, drunken brawls or whatever it is. So. Councilman Thompson, you have our commitment that, in fact, we would work collaboratively. We, in Tempe, um, just because of the pure scale, we have a public safety IGA where we agree to work together and we work on a number of, of different issues. So you have our commitment. We would, in fact, do that. I have some other questions as well. So I know the voters uh, turned down ASU uh, coming to Mesa in 2016. Uh, so which ballot measure are we considering uh, putting this back out to the voters? Mayor, Councilmember Whitaker, we are not uh, anticipating this to be a ballot measure, that this would be something that the city would be able to um, fund without the need for voter approval. Hmm. What's the reasoning behind that? I mean, do we not feel the necessity to go back out to the voters and ask them for their opinion when they explicitly told us that we didn't want ASU or like what are we not? So I'm not going to comment on this on the specific opinion, but um, the, the requirement for the ballot measure was to approve the sales tax that was associated with both public safety as well as the um, improvements related to ASU. And that was we can't increase the sales tax without a voter approval. So what's our funding source? Mayor and Council, as I previously mentioned before, we have um, in the past um, several times funded economic investment projects through the Enterprise Fund. Um, so consistent with that, uh, with how we've done spring training, how we've done the Mesa Center for Higher Education and Benu, we would look to the Enterprise Fund as the source where we would fund um, the uh, payment for the uh, capitalization of this project. Okay. Uh, using what type of bond? Well, so anytime we use the enterprise fund, um, and it's and, and without there's no would be no pledge of property taxes. So at that that would then become they would be what we would call revenue bonds uh, that the city has issued in the past. Again, for the same those same very projects that I've mentioned. And the revenue bonds require uh, a guaranteed income stream, I'm assuming, at some rate to pay those revenue bonds yeah, we, off. Right, sir, certainly. We pledge the city's excise tax collections as a coverage for um, the debt service payment. So not specifically related to the reason why the bonds were taken out, but more generally, you can justify the bonds using any source of revenue that exists within. Right, the, 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 they serve a certain purpose. The, sales, the excise tax collections for the city serve as the pledge for the coverage of the bonds, but the payment from the bonds, for example, for spring training, why we had to pledge excise taxes for the construction of the Cub Stadium as well as the A Stadium, the payment of those bonds is actually coming from the sale of city-owned land. So I guess the issue that I have then, the What's this that? coming from the enterprise fund then, so essentially this will be uh, funded through, uh, in the most part, water bills 
to our citizens as well as uh, the electric bills. So have we considered what is the cost per uh, resident in Mesa, the increased cost per resident on uh, from a water perspective and from an electric perspective? So those are not the only two um, parts of the Enterprise Fund. The Enterprise Fund includes many other activities uh, that feed into um, the Enterprise Fund. Um, but as, we've, as I mentioned previously in a, a question previously presented, um, we have been able to um, refund some bonds and created savings um, from debt service. Uh, we also see, anticipate, and forecast that with this project has been mentioned several times that it'll create an economic um, stimulator. So we believe that that will increase additional revenues to our enterprise fund that will help to um, offset some of this cost. And then just um, most significantly, we have seen significant growth in the enterprise fund going forward, uh, both from, especially from the manufacturing and the industrial um, com um, uh, customers of the city. Uh, as well as significant growth in some sections. Those funds um, have, uh, we believe, allow us to be able to fund this activity, uh, this project, without having a significant impact on the ratepayers in the future. Okay, so I can go back to my constituents and say that we won't see any water bill uh, increases, right? Because this is one of the biggest things that I get hit with is that the water bills are always going up. So I'm assuming we're at the point now where the water bills Will not Mayor and Council, until we, again, that's one of the reasons that we have to go develop a project budget and a master plan to consider what those costs are going to be and the financial impact as it fits inside the enterprise fund um, as it sits today. So we're going to take into account, again, the savings from debt, the additional increases that we're seeing uh, with large um, customers and our utilities and future growth. Um, and until I have a number that we've agreed to, the parties have agreed to, it's difficult for me to tell you what impact it'll have on growth. But sitting here today, I can tell you that fund is doing very well. Um, and as it has in the past, we have used it as a way to help fund a lot of projects um, in downtown Mesa and throughout the city. Okay. Um, on one of the uh, slides, Jeff, you'd indicated that the uh, there's an agreement between the subleasing of commercial space. So how would that process work? Would, would, does ASU own the space and we would agree to allow them to sublease it? Or are you saying that we would own the space and we're then allowed to sublease that space as a municipality? Mayor, uh, Councilmember Whitaker, some of that detail would have to be part of, of the detailed lease negotiations. But what we, what we had negotiated um, as part of this IGA and what we had negotiated in the past is that ASU would have control over the entire building area. Uh, which would include the first floor that could include food and beverage um, operators. ASU would be responsible for the leasing, um, the management of those spaces, um, and they would collect the rent. However, any net rent over and above what um, is necessary for their O&M costs would, be, would go back to the city as um, essentially net revenues to the city. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. If you could just give me a second to look through this. Um, as far as the building goes in working with uh, other higher education institutions, you know, uh, what did the proposal look like from U of A or NAU as far as what they would be willing to pay rent for this space? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Wicker, we have not had any discussions with other universities uh, for this space. And there's no, uh, there's no gift clause violations that are occurring from that perspective? Intergovernmental, I'm assuming, correct? Correct. Is there any desire to have other higher education universities, or is this strictly an ASU deal? Well, I think we did, we've just mentioned in our discussions that um, we are going to be, and I think the mayor's had conversations with NAU and MCC. Ben U, we believe, will be a very important part of this discussion. They're already very much engaged with CAHOOTS and will be very much an important part of what happens in the downtown area. We imagine they may be interested in being part of the uh, innovation studio also. Yeah, I, I, I can confirm that, Jeremy, that uh, I have had conversations as of a week ago with the president of NAU and the chancellor of Mace Community College. Uh, ben Yu, as you know, is, is also very excited about how this will impact uh, their amenities and their ability to track students and to partner on, on projects. So, no, no, I think it's this is far from an exclusive, the, the innovation, downtown innovation district is far from an, an exclusive ASU project. ASU would be an exciting uh, anchor 
but uh, higher ed as a general theme would, would continue to be a big part of downtown, not exclusive to ASU. Okay. So at some point we'll have discussions with NAU, U of A mm -hmm. will be in here, then I'm assuming presenting well, their yeah. proposals? Well, I think what the mayor said, that's not what, Mayor, do you want to clarify your statement again? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, U of A, the, I've had no conversations with U of A, and, and to some extent uh, there may be, you, you can't cannibalize each other. It's got to be very complementary. You know, the, the, pro, the, the, the programs that ASU brings here shouldn't imp, you know, take away from uh, the programs that Ben U is offering. MCC doesn't want to offer programs that, are, that, that compete with NAU. So there's very much a collaboration that needs to take place. Now, I, I, I could certainly envision uh, at some point in the future U of A having a program that it doesn't cannibalize some of the other programs and they might may want to they might be very attracted to this space and come knocking on our door but uh, to, at this point at this stage in the progress uh, those are the institutions that have expressed an interest in participating okay uh, the other question I have is um, if uh, say we have another recession ASU decides to leave Mesa who's on the hook for that um, default, if you will. Yeah, so included in the agreement is the I, the concept that um, once we make the commitment and if we issue bonds uh, for this facility, and at uh, some point in the future during that time of the um, term of the bond, uh, that ASU were to, I guess, I mean, completely vacate the area, they would be obligated to pay off the balance. So there's a no net negative effect. I mean, if they left, we're getting our bonds paid off. Well, as far from the capital side, obviously, um, I think there'd be, I'm assuming by that point, there's been a lot of commitments of other, other development in downtown Mesa that's been, uh, that's here because of ASU, and that would obviously be significant impact to the city from a variety of different perspectives. But as far as the finance is concerned, we are protected on the bonds that those would be repaid. Okay. What does the ROI look like from a bond perspective outside of the more macroeconomic things? You know, what, what's our return on investment? I mean, so it's a 99-year lease at $100,000 a year. So, Mayor and Council, I think the Mayor mentioned about the economic impact study um, that was completed um, in anticipation of doing this project, again, at a different scale. Um, and that number at that time um, was for that entire project was five, four, four and a half. Four and a half million, four and a half billion dollars. You know, we've kind of taken their numbers and cut them back to the scale of where we see this project, where this phased and much re reduced project is. Um, and so taking that sa those same assumptions, the number we would believe that if that study were done today, it would be closer to a billion dollars. Yeah, I guess it's just hard to quantify from a municipal perspective how much money of that's actually going back into our pockets, right? Because when I look at the the debt from the city of Mesa for the last 10 years, you know, I think we've seen something like a 40% uh, increase uh, over the last decade, roughly, right? So, like, I just question the actual economic impact as it affects our bottom line as a municipality. Yeah, but if you, yeah, but that's a great example. So, if you were to go look at the last 10 years, the debt that we've issued, but if you look at the value of, of, of investment in Mesa during those last 10 years, it's a billion times many. I mean, you look at um, Apple, you look at all the investments in residential and commercial investments that have been made that have been leveraged by that debt to build out infrastructure that has brought Apple, that's brought Niagara, that's bringing data centers. Um, it's not an immediate return on investment, but in the long term, I would, I would suggest it's one of the greatest investments that Mesa has made. Um, spring training is probably gonna pay for itself in five years, five to six years. Um, so we've invested $100 million in facilities, um, but every year we see you know, millions of dollars returning back to the city in a variety of ways. So you know, there's only a few ways the city can invest in itself, and that's one of the reasons we picked the Enterprise Fund, because it's the easiest way for us to identify that return on investment, that putting a dollar into bringing activities like this into the downtown where we control all of the major enterprises is probably the most certain way for us to recapture back the value of these kinds of investments. So it's kind of been our pattern of how we've done things um, in a variety of ways. And so when we can do it in the downtown, 
I know Mr. Thompson, <laughs> but it's, it, it, because we control all the utilities here, it gives us the greatest opportunity to recover investment. But you know, we've done it out at ASU Poly. We, we built out all the water and sewer in the streets out there. Uh, we did that back in 2006, I believe. And back then, I think we barely had 1,000 students. Now we have 5,000 students. And I can tell you, with the, all the little bikes driving around campus and off campus shopping in that area, if we could just annex the uh, west side of Power Road, we would have captured back a lot of that retail activity, right, Mr. Thompson? So I think this is a unique way for the city to invest in itself that we are able to capture um, in a most um, comprehensive way all of those benefits that can, we can capture literally and can identify back to the city. Um, so that's, this is the easiest and most efficient way for the city to invest in itself and recapture those benefits through our enterprise fund. Yeah, so I won't keep going back and forth, but ultimately the thing that I look at is the debt per capita, right? That's the amount of debt for every single individual in the city of Mesa. And so long as that number is going up, then I would argue against the fact that it's actually benefiting uh, anybody in the community if they are on the hook for that debt, um, you know, decades into the future, right? I mean, that ultimately is the deciding indicator as to outside of quality of life, you know, financially. I, I'm not sure, well, we can, that's probably probably going to topic. We can have that debate because um, we've made those investments and the generations today are definitely benefiting from improved infrastructure across the city. We have to invest in water treatment plants. We have to invest in water, wastewater treatment plants. That's over $200 million right there. And if we're going to get deemed on doing those things, then we have to shut the city down and not issue any more permits. No, I wholeheartedly agree with so you. So it's those are definitely debt is, but this is debt that is getting repaid um, in in very similar ways by um, those who pay their utilities. And it's um, if the city doesn't reinvest in itself, then the question is who will. Um, and so that's what we're. I think we're trying, and I think we're doing it in a modest way. And I think you look at our debt ratios comparative across the country for cities our size and our age. Don't compare me to towns. Compare me, com compare me to large metropolitan cities that have been around for over 100 years. That's what you need to compare Mesa to, and we stand head and shoulders with everybody else. Yeah, I don't ag disagree with the historical or the other cities. It's just the decisions moving forward. And no, I understand. We, we need to, we have to be cautious from an ROI perspective. And I agree. And I think that's why you see in these negotiations, we, without having that dedicated sales tax, we have negotiated this project down to a much more modest uh, uh, element, and we've even given the option that um, if ASU needs those other buildings in the future, um, we, we have the opportunity to have a discussion about whether we're going to do it or whether we have ASU do it. So we have taken that into account. We have tried to be very conservative in our approach. We're only committing, I get, we're all talking about this big um, process, but we're only talking about one building. And a, and a second floor of a building that the city owns behind it. So we're showing a lot of future opportunities, but right now our hard commitment is a very modest start to what we hope will be something grand and that we'll be able to justify going forward. But right now it's a very modest step, a very small step going forward. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Mr. Thompson. And I think to Jeremy's point, I think to be completely transparent, um, the citizens need to realize, too, that ASU does have the ability to bond themselves for capital improvements. Um, so they certainly have that capacity to be able to go out and, and do a bond of their own to build their own um, infrastructure and campus. Uh, and, and, you know, I, 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 I'm like Councilmember Whitaker, and you you said it best, Chris, is, is reinvesting in ourselves. and. And I struggle sometimes when, when we talk about, you know, the enterprise fund and and, um, and how we use those how we use those funds. I mean, you know, um, Councilmember Luna really needs a police station in his district. I really need a fire station, probably more so than I need an ASU campus downtown in Eastmark. And when we have funds available, um, such as our enterprise fund, where we can reinvest in our city without going out and putting additional burden on the citizens, you know, I would love to explore those opportunities and how we can utilize, you know, uh, our existing funds without going out and bonding and, and putting that debt back onto the, the citizens. No, I, and I, I agree. I mean, if we can avoid issuing debt, that's fine. But let me remind the council, um, the city of Mesa from the Enterprise Fund uh, 
allocates over $100 million to support public safety. And, I mean, that's all it goes to. And that still doesn't cover all the costs, but 100, over $100 million of the enterprise fund is committed today uh, to cover the cost um, related to public safety. And so um, it's significant. Um, and over 10 years, that's a big number. Um, and we've been doing that consistently for years. And so I think it's trying to balance, you know, funding operations and public safety, which is important to sustain the city. And, and this is going to be a much smaller portion than that, which is reinvesting in the city to try to generate more activity that hopefully will generate the types of revenues that will help us enhance providing quality of services, including public safety and libraries and parks uh, for the rest of the city also. Thank you. Uh, just to, to piggyback on some of the issues that I've heard a, a moment ago, I, I see reclaiming our downtown, frankly, as addressing a public safety issue. Uh, if, I would invite people to do ride-alongs with some of our public safety folks in West Mason and downtown, and you're going to have a very busy night on a Friday or a Saturday night. And I think if we, to, to reclaim some of these uh, parts of our city that are in decline, we need to invest and we need to revitalize and you're going to see public safety uh, savings actually as we activate some of these parts of our, of our community. Uh, and then one of the issues related to are we going to have, you know, uh, more calls for service if we invite more students to our downtown ASU from the, one of the first conversations I had with them they said you're going to need to th this will create a demand for student housing and you're going to have to decide if that's the environment you want or not uh, and, and, and that decision still will, will rest with us if we want to take more of a downtown ASU uh, higher uh, ed uh, upper division not a Mill Avenue-esque uh, environment which would be my preference then that, the ball is in our court to make that decision and, and to preserve the authentic uh, character of our downtown by not being aggressive in, in approving student housing in, in our downtown. And that's certainly something that I would advocate for. Um, again, the reason we go to, to, the, to the voters is when we increase their taxes. And the, the number, we just completed our Imagine Mesa program uh, a few weeks ago, it seems like. Uh, over 67,000 folks uh, engaged in that. There were over 470 ideas. The number one vote receiver on that project and then that entire program was build an ASU cam campus without raising taxes. So this is in response to what folks in our community are telling us that they see as a need and something that there's interest to. Uh, and so I, I think, that, again, that, that's, that's the, uh, the parameters that we're dealing with. with we're not talking about raising taxes. Uh, and in, in fact, to the ROI argument, the, the studies show that there is a net in economic increase. The re there, there's two reasons for doing this. The first, and, and, and it's very important in and of itself, is that we are an undereducated under community in, in the city of Mesa. We need more higher education attainment. When you compare Mesa to our peers uh, surrounding us, Chandler, Gilbert, Tempe, uh, we have a lower attainment level of higher education. As a result of that, predictably, we have a lower per capita income in our community. So it, we are undereducated. Under we need to do what we can to invite more opportunities for folks to progress uh, economically through higher education. So this checks that box. But at the same time, if, let's say you set that aside. Let's say you don't care about that or you don't buy that argument. From an economic development standpoint, again, the, the economic impact statements that we've done show that this is a net increase in the economic activity in, in the billions of dollars, uh, particularly when we own all of the uh, utility assets in downtown. The more development that occurs in downtown, that pays a, a large return to our bottom line as a, as a, as a provider of utilities. So I, this is the first of many uh, discussions and many, many meetings that we're going to have on, on this. Um, I uh, appreciate all the, the due diligence that's gone into this. Again, the proposal that we'll, that we'll be voting on uh, the, at the end of this month is to uh, elevate this discussion and to, to flesh it out and to, to come back with numbers uh, so that we can fit it into our priorities uh, as we determine uh, what we want to pay for, what's most important in our community. Uh, but thank you to ASU for accepting our invitation uh, to uh, engage in this conversation. Uh, they've been a great partner uh, and uh, look forward to continue to work in, you in, in every way that we can. Yes, Jeremy. So on the topic of increasing taxes, you know, sales tax increase goes 
into the general fund. It's all coming out of the same bucket. So whether we want to call this a sales tax increase or not, ultimately this is a regressive tax towards some of the lowest income families in Mesa, the people that pay their water bills and the people that pay their electric bills. Those are the ones that are gonna see increased rates and those are the ones that this is gonna be shouldered on. Just to clarify, like we can call it a tax or not call it a tax, ultimately those are the individuals that'll be paying for this program. Yeah. I appreciate but disagree. Uh, I think what we're talking about is spurring economic activity in our community. Uh, I had the privilege of being on our city council 20 years ago when we were handed the keys to the Williams uh, Air Force Base. At the time, there were a lot of people in our community that said, why are we throwing the money away to, to try to invest in that, uh, that landing strip that's surrounded by cactus and rattlesnakes? Uh, today, we are reaping huge economic benefits. Uh, every day, there's a, another great announcement and all of the economic impact that's coming out of that uh, it, obviously, the, the, the wisdom of the people who had foresight and saw that by investing in that facility, uh, there was huge opportunities that would pay off maybe a generation later uh, in our city. Uh, it, I think the overly conservative approach of, of not reinvesting in our community is, is not in the long run going to save money. It's not going to help the under, underserved folks in our community. Investing in, edu in education uh, and improving our economy is what's going to help those folks. Um, but again, as we, we'll, we'll, we'll have, this is the first of many debates, uh, but uh, I appreciate your point of view, uh, but uh, absolutely disagree with it and, and would argue the opposite is true. Other comments or questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, all the work that's gone into this. Uh, the next item on our uh, agenda is item two, information per pertaining to the current job order contracting projects. Oh, I, I apologize. I apologize. Thank you for being so uh, so uh, patient. Courtney Gwynn has uh, filed a card to, to speak on this agenda item. Mr. Gwynn, thank you for being here. No, uh, thank we've you. We've allocated three minutes. I'll try to keep it to that. Uh, do I need to state where I live? My name's Courtney Gwynn. I live on 533 North Dade in Mesa. Uh, to be honest, the more I heard the discussion, the more frustrated I got. Um, last night I had the opportunity of going to Tempe uh, to the ASU campus with my oldest who's going into high school and he told me he wanted to go to ASU. I was ecstatic. It's a great school. They have the reputation. They have the education. They have the money. We just heard ASU say that they're willing to pay for future buildings. You know what? Let's get them to pay for the initial building. We talked about Boeing, about other companies that want this deal to happen. You know what, let's see if we can get some of those businesses to help invest as well so that the city isn't strapped for it. Uh, one of the most frustrating things to hear was Mr. Brady's discussion over where the money's coming from. If we're getting a return on all of the investments we're making through the enterprise fund, our debt would not continue to go up. When you're getting a return on your investment, you're able to pay down debt. Uh, I was one of the voters in 2016 that voted against paying for the sales tax increase for public safety and for ASU. The only reason I voted against it was because I didn't want to spend that much money for ASU. We need more public safety. That issue has still not been solved. At 4 a.m. this morning, I had a wanderer coming up to my door Luckily, I have the ring doorbell, so I, I got the motion alert, was able to scare him off. But those are the things we're facing in West Mesa because we don't have the public safety we need. And now we're talking about spending it elsewhere where obviously the enterprise fund must be a, a magic pot of money where we can use as much as we want and we won't ever have to pay for it. Let's use it on public safety. Let's protect what we have. Uh, when it comes to Imagine Mesa, I also participated in that event. I voted for ASU to come down without the sales tax increase. Mayor, what that meant to people like me and to other voters when we saw that was that ASU would be paying for that investment, not the city of Mesa through the enterprise fund, which would then be worked out in our water bills, our electric bills, or other avenues. So when you look at the responses received, don't think that we were in favor of that if we get the money elsewhere. We were in favor of it 
if ASU pays for it ourselves. Again, I, I hope that ASU can find a way to, to come to downtown Mesa. I do think it would be a great benefit for our city, but with the amount of debt we have, I think the voters spoke in 2016, and I think the sentiment is still the same, that we do not want to continue to incur debt, and I would hate to see ASU come to Mesa under those pretenses and have a majority of the city frustrated with them being there when we had to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gwynn. Uh, all right, the next item on our agenda is item two, information pertaining to the current job order contracting projects. Council, any questions regarding those projects that you've been part of your agenda? Hearing none, the next item on this uh, is to acknowledge receipt of minutes of various boards and committees. Is there a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Luna. Thank you, Chris. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Next is to hear reports on meetings and conferences attended. Council, anything you'd like to share with us? All right, hearing none, Mr. Brady, can you help us know what the schedule is for our next meetings? Yeah, Mayor, uh, we are um, scheduled for our next study session Thursday, February 22nd at 7.30 a.m. I And also want to let you know, and we'll start providing more additional information, but I think we've yesterday we were able to uh, get a date for our uh, strategic planning session, and it looks like that date will now be the morning of Monday, March 5th. That's when we could find most of you available, or in town anyway. Great. So uh, to that, uh, in, in preparation for the strategic planning meeting on the 5th, I, I guess we'll have a couple more meetings before that, but uh, I think right now the, the, the idea is that the, we would have a facilitator there just to help us not get bogged down in, in the weeds or get too far afield during that discussion so that we can increase the likelihood that it'll be productive. Uh, there's been discussions made that, that people ought to do, I guess we, let, let's do a little prep to the council to say here's what we hope to accomplish, here's what we would encourage you to do to prepare for that. If there's specific issues or, or, or projects that you're anxious to make sure we, we discuss during that, uh, please come prepared to that or, or communicate that to me or Mr. Brady beforehand so we make sure that that we increase the likelihood that, that uh, no one's frustrated at the end of that process because we didn't spend the time or the energy on, on what was most important. Any other suggestions from the council on that? But I guess we'll, we'll have the chance to talk a, a time or two before that as well. Jeremy. I would just say one thing is that, you know, I hope that everybody from council brings their own perspective as far as what things are important to them um, so that we do stay on topic and we can actually come up with a plan as far as what council would like to see get accomplished over the next year. Hopefully the, uh, the facilitator will help with that as well to kind of keep things moving. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Brady, anything else? Nope, that's it, thanks. Thank you, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Chris and Mr. Luna. All in favor, please say aye. Aye, aye. aye. we are adjourned. Aye.